This happened last month, and I'm still in shock. My boyfriend and I went hiking in Alabama. We both are avid campers and organize many camping trips, but this was our special tour, so we chose a high range surrounded by deep green woods. Alex is very sporty and loves joking to cheer up the mood. The woods were deep, and we had to carry a map of the area so we wouldn't get lost. After parking our car at the road near the hiking trail, we took our backpacks and started the journey. The plan was to hike to the big waterfall amidst the forest and then come back eventually. The waterfall was located right in the middle of the forest, so we had to walk a moderate amount of distance. I felt refreshed as soon as the pure air touched my lungs. I've always been a fitness freak, so hiking is like meditation for me. Luckily, Alex shared the same interest, and that's why we fell for each other. Isn't the weather lovely? No more than you. Oh, stop it. Don't be so cheesy. Look there. As I followed the direction he pointed to, Alex tickled me in the <laughs> waist and ran ahead of me like a six-year-old. You know I'm faster than you. Then why are you standing so far? I ran to him, and he started running ahead again. He was mocking me, and I was laughing too, while chasing him in those woods. Life is really fun with him. After a point, we got tired and stopped to take a few breaths. We can't lose our energy like this. The waterfall is still a few miles away. Come on, we have to get back before dark. Yeah, like it was my idea to chase you. He caressed my cheek while smiling flirtatiously, and we started to walk again. There were narrow trails scattered around the woods, and we had no idea which one ended where. The only thing we knew was that one wrong direction was enough to get us lost in these woods forever. After walking for two hours straight, when we were near the waterfall, the sun was above our heads. The height of the waterfall stood like a hidden world, I had been to many forest waterfalls before, but I don't know why this one felt like a dream. The stones covering the waterfalls were all covered in green moss. Even the pond where the water dropped was green too. Wow, the water is so green. Yeah, makes it look even more beautiful. I'm feeling hungry. Let's eat, shall we? Alex sat down on a big rock and started taking pictures on his phone while I unpacked our lunch. I brought chicken sandwiches, fruit salads, and some chocolate pudding. I knew the long hike would make us hungry, so I brought enough for the two of us. I handed him the sandwich and started to eat some salad first. We were eating and enjoying the sound of the waterfall when another sound came to our attention. The waterfall wasn't that big, so the sound was quite mellow. With the reverberating water, there was a sound of soil like someone was digging the ground. The sound came from the end of a narrow trail on our left. What is that sound? Seems like we are not the only ones here. Doesn't it sound like digging? Um, let's check it out. But we should be heading back soon. Yeah, we will, Corey. But don't you want to know the mystery behind the sound? I still regret not saying no. We left our belongings near the waterfall and started to follow the sound. After walking two or three minutes on that narrow trail, we reached a big tree. The sound was now clearer. As we peeked behind the tree, we saw a weird-looking man digging holes in the middle of the woods. He was wearing brown trousers and a tattered jacket. He wore black rubber gloves and was digging the soil with a rusty spade. He was sweating like hell due to the exertion of the work, but the hole he dug wasn't even a foot deep so I wondered why he looked so tired. What the hell is he doing? Doesn't he look too tired to dig a hole that small? Exactly. I was thinking that too. The man suddenly looked in our direction, and we hid behind the tree immediately. Alex whispered to me. Do you think he saw us? I was breathing heavily out of panic, so I didn't answer him and waited for the digging sound to start again. Everything remained silent for a few seconds. At that time, I could imagine the man staring at the big tree with his creepy eyes, hoping to see someone interfering in his mysterious business. But when the digging resumed again, we both exhaled a sigh of relief. I looked at Alex and said in a low voice, I don't want to stay here anymore. Can we please leave? 
Yeah, let's crouch down so he doesn't see us. We crawled on the ground like a four-legged animal to avoid being seen by this weird man. After coming back to the waterfall, we started to pack our stuff when Alex said, Can you hear that? I don't hear anything. Exactly. The digging sound has stopped. I wonder what he is doing now. Well, I don't. I am going back. You are most welcome to join me. Alex and I started to hike back, but as we wasted our time spying on this creepy guy, when we reached the car, it had gotten dark. We had to drive for an hour more to leave the woods and get on the highway. Thinking how scary it would be to drive amongst the woods, I felt extremely scared. Also, the sight of that man spooked me enough. We got inside our car and Alex started the engine. As the headlights hit the dark road ahead, a cold shiver ran down my spine. The creepy man with the spade was now standing on the road, blocking our way. He was looking at our car with a gaze full of nothing but hatred. But then he smiled most disturbingly and said, What did you see? His voice was squeaky and harsh at the same time. My hands were numb and Alex's face turned pale too. He replied in a fumbled voice. What the? Did he follow us? I asked you a question. What did you see back there? Nothing, okay? We saw nothing. Just you digging a stupid hole in the ground. Now move out of our way before we run you over. Hearing me threaten him, his eyes got even bigger with fury, and he spat on our windshield. Are you insane? Why can't you just leave us alone? Because you guys didn't do the same to me. I can't let you leave. I am sorry. Or maybe I am not. <laughs> Saying this, the man ran at us at full speed and smashed the windshield with his spade. With just one hard hit, the entire glass cracked. Start the car! Start the car, Alex! Alex turned on the engine, and the man hit the windshield once again, making the glass shatter. I was covered in broken glass that resulted in cuts all over my skin. So was Alex, but he pressed the accelerator with all his strength and with a loud screech, the car started. The man immediately jumped to the side of the road to save himself from getting run over. I swear, if he didn't move, we would have run him over that night. As we drove away, he watched us while cursing in foul language. When we got onto the highway, we were shaking in fear. I started crying, and Alex was petrified too. We went straight to the nearby police station and reported the incident. The cops took pictures of our car for their report and told us to identify the spot where we saw the man digging. The next day, we all went to that same place, but the man was nowhere to be found. The cops searched the area with dogs and they barked at the ground where he was digging. The cops found the body of a young boy who had been missing for a year. The boy had torture marks all over his body and signs of strangulation on his neck. It seemed like this man abducted the kid and tortured him for ransom. But his torture grew to such an extent that the boy eventually died. Being scared of the cops, he came deep into the woods to bury his body. He had to drag the body all this way, which is why he was panting while digging the hole that day. Alex and I have given proper information about his facial structure so the cops can catch this psycho murderer. I hope he gets arrested soon for what he did. They said, be careful what you wish for. I never thought I will understand this the hard way. My wife Selena and I have been married for almost five years now. We met in the same workplace and fell for each other. I was a senior to her, so within the next few years, I got promoted to a big job role and had to shift to a new place. Selena had to quit to move with me, and I felt really bad that she had to give up her job for me. She tried to land new jobs here, but luck wasn't in her favor. Though we were well off depending on my job, I realized she was frustrated losing her financial independence. I didn't want to go over the line, so I never pushed her to join jobs with my recommendation. If I was in her place, I would have felt obligated too in that matter. So, after I left the office, she was alone in the house all day. A few weeks went by like this, until one Sunday afternoon, changed our lives forever. 
I was sitting on the balcony smoking a cigar when I heard Selena talking to her friend, Kayla. I could only hear what she said, which went like this. Oh, please. You know I will never do that, Kayla. Yeah, right. You are such a flirt. Please, that's not my idea of fun. No thanks, but you please be safe. I've heard websites like these can get you in trouble. Yeah, bye. After she disconnected the call, I couldn't hold my curiosity. So I asked her, what was she and Kayla talking about? She told me her friend Kayla runs an OnlyFans account. Not having the slightest idea about this website, I kept glancing at her with a blank face. You know, where women can earn money from followers. So, these followers just pay you? Obviously not. You have to fulfill their wishes. Oh, what wishes? You know, flirting with them and sending them private pictures. What? Really? Yeah, but it's all in your control. Like, if you don't want someone bothering you, then you can remove them and stuff like that. How much is Kayla earning from all this? Well, about... 50 to 100 dollars a day what that's crazy yeah she was telling me to do only fans until i land a new job then why aren't you what are you serious yeah of course you want your wife to share her private pictures with strangers for money no not your pictures i have a great idea arthur you are confusing me i fired up my laptop on the tea table and asked Selena to sit beside me. And then I explained to her my plan. Let's say you create an account in this OnlyFans site. Now, you add followers and talk to them. They ask you to send your private pictures, but instead of sending your snaps, you can always download from Google and other sites. You know, from where? No one will know it's not you and some other chick. Think about it. You'll earn as much money as any other user, right? I don't know. Sites like this are jam-packed with creeps. That's why this plan is brilliant. The creeps are seeing some mother chick and you get the money. Come on, it'll be fun. Also, I'll be right beside you. It's easy money, Selena. Think about it. She thought about it and eventually agreed. In the next few hours, I created her account, put a profile picture of a girl wearing a swimsuit facing her back at the camera. We added some more pictures that were randomly selected from the internet, but enough to grab attention. I was stunned by the growth of her account in such a short span. She gained 2,000 followers in just three weeks and started interacting with them. Sometimes we even made fun of people in chat by asking for more money. And some people were willing to pay anything just to see naked pictures. It was a mundane Tuesday night. I was watching TV when I heard Selena say, Whoa, what a freak. I immediately looked at her and saw she was staring at my laptop with a cringed face. What's wrong? God, this dude is creeping the hell out of me. Why is he sending me pics of his hairy chest? I sprung towards her and looked at her OnlyFans account. <laughs> Maybe he wants you to count them. Aw, oh, not funny, Arthur. What's the big deal? Just remove him from your followers list. He's asking me to send pics of my bare bag. Download one from Google and ask for $100 in return. I expected the man will go away after hearing the amount for only one pic. But surprisingly, he paid the money without saying anything. But as soon as he opened the picture, he sent a pretty disturbing text to my wife. This guy named Lone Wolf 69 said, This isn't you. I want to see the real you. Arthur, what the shit is this? How did he know? Relax. Let me talk to him. I took the laptop from her and texted. Of course it's me, darling. What are you saying? Do you want more photos? What the man said next swept the ground beneath my feet. Let me talk to your wife. I have no interest in talking to her husband. Oh my God, how the hell? But before Selena could finish her words, the laptop screen got covered with glitches and somehow our webcam turned on connecting us to a video call. I don't know how it happened, but the only possible explanation was that we got hacked by this lone wolf 69. A red room opened on our screen. At first, 
there was no one on the other side. But slowly, a figure started to appear from the dark corner. As soon as it came to light, my wife screamed in horror. It was an old man dressed like a little girl. He had braids tied with ribbons, wore a tattered pink frock, and had red lipstick smeared all over his mouth that made him look vicious. His attire made my skin crawl. He grinned at us real big and said, You can't fool me. How? How did you? It doesn't matter how I did it. What matters is what I'm going to do next. He looked at Selena, who was sobbing in fear sitting beside me, and ran his fingers on the camera as if he was running them onto her body. You freak! I tried to close the website and even turn off the laptop, but nothing was working. <laughs> you can try, silly boy. But you can't get rid of me so easily. He then got up from the screen and started to drag something towards us that was lying on the ground. What happened next was beyond our imagination. He dragged a woman from the ground who seemed to be tied and made her sit in front of the screen. Oh my God, Kayla! Now you will know what happens when you try to fool your fans. <laughs> We had no idea how he reached Kayla, but considering his hacking skills, it wasn't hard to guess that he knew more about us than we knew about him. Kayla was in tears, but couldn't cry as her mouth was duct taped. The man then picked up a trimmer and started to shave Kayla's head in front of our eyes. I wanted to call the cops, but what will I report to them? We don't know anything about this man's whereabouts. Still, I dialed 911 on my phone with a man screamed. If you call the cops, I will slit her throat and gouge out her eyes right in front of you. Please, stop this. Let my friend go. Selena said while pleading to him. I kept the phone down after being threatened by this psycho. He then shaved Kayla's eyebrows and licked her cheek while looking right into our eyes. Poor Kayla. I could only imagine what she was going through at that point. He then grinned one more time and said, Don't worry, I'll let her go. She is not the one I want. It's your wife. <laughs> I want to see how she looks inside of those clothes for real. Goodbye, author. I'll see you soon, Selena. And then he kissed the cam like he was kissing my wife and the screen went black. We sat down in silence, trying to anticipate what had just happened. I eventually called the cops, and they started looking for Kayla, who was last seen shopping at the supermarket that day. Two days went by, and then one night, we heard a loud banging on our door. Thinking it was that man trying to abduct my wife, I came down with a baseball bat while Selena picked up a kitchen knife. But as we opened our door, we found Kayla lying on our porch and saw a speeding black van drive away. She was unconscious and had various injuries all over her body. The cops were called and they interrogated her about this man. Kayla said she was putting groceries in her car when someone hit her from behind. What happened after that isn't hard to guess. I just hope this man gets arrested soon before he attempts to abduct my wife. On my wedding day, I was very happy. My husband-to-be and I had had a hard time deciding where we would get married. So to help us, my aunt, the woman who had raised me, suggested that we do it in a famous huge hotel near the beach. Although the place was far from our city, the idea convinced us. In the end, my aunt was the one who booked it and took care of everything about it. That day, my future husband arrived at the hotel very early in the morning. There, he prepared himself and helped as much as he could while he waited for me. Due to various problems, I ended up arriving later than I should have. But finally, there I was, in the reception of the huge and beautiful hotel where I was getting married. Since I was late, as soon as I was there, the ceremony was supposed to start. But we soon realized a big problem. Eric, my fiancé, 
was nowhere to be found. The moment my aunt told me, fear ran through me from head to toe. I knew he couldn't have regretted it. We had been together since high school, and we loved each other deeply. We had even made plans for what we would do after the wedding, where we would move and how many children we would have. But the minutes passed, and they couldn't find him, so I started to have a bad feeling. I was afraid that something had happened to him. Even though my aunt insisted that I shouldn't look for him so he wouldn't see my dress, I couldn't sit still any longer. Eric's brother said that he had last seen him going to the hotel bar, so I went there. Hello, miss. How can I help you? I quickly described my fiancé's appearance to the bartender and asked him if he knew where he had gone. Uh, I... I think maybe he... Uncomfortably, he shifted his gaze to the two glasses on the bar counter. Sometime before I arrived at the hotel, Eric had gone to the bar unaccompanied. There, he had talked for a few minutes with the bartender while he waited for the sangria he had ordered to be served. Just as he began to drink, a gorgeous woman sat down next to him. It didn't take long for her to set her fox-like eyes on the man who would soon marry me. With a mischievous smile on her red lips, she began to chat with him. Eric, perhaps seeking to relax, responded over and over to the woman's questions and comments. At some point in the entertaining conversation, the woman started flirting with him, but that didn't make him move away. On the contrary, although he wasn't reciprocating her, it was possible that the thought that he was desired by a beautiful woman made him feel good. Handsome, don't you have any manners? Aren't you going to buy me a drink? <laughs> I'm getting married soon. In fact, I'm waiting for my fiancé. <laughs> I told you, this is a matter of manners, groom. Finally, Eric ended up offering the woman a margarita. From that moment on, his attitude became more and more flirty because she insisted and he couldn't resist. That woman, as attractive as a magnet and as beautiful as a jewel, had ended up captivating a man who would soon be united with me, his fiance, until death did us part. Besides, he was having a great time with her. It could be said that their attitudes were very compatible, so Eric didn't want the moment to end. Well, I'm leaving. It's been a pleasure, groom. What? Already? Listening to Eric after getting up, the woman would have turned to see him once more with her bluish gaze, trying to contain a mocking smile before speaking. Do you want to come with me, handsome? I'm getting married. Consider it one last fling before you're bound forever. Without thinking about it much longer, Eric decided to go with the woman, just like a metal goes after a magnet. But unfortunately, I didn't know that while I was looking for him. I think he went to his room. Although the bartender didn't seem too sure, I decided to follow his lead and ask the receptionist which room was ours. There, also with an uncomfortable look, she told me that it was number 68 on the second floor. As I waited for the elevator, I couldn't help but think about what could have happened to Eric. Thousands of horrible scenarios ran through my head, but I dismissed them immediately. I wanted to think that he was just preparing a surprise for me in our room. Already on the second floor, the calm of the night was noticeable in how empty and silent the place was. With hasty steps, I approached room number 68, whose light seemed to be on. Before turning the knob and opening it, laughter coming from inside stopped me. One was from a man, Eric, of course and the other was from a woman. Immediately, a lump formed in my throat. I can't believe you agreed to come to this room. <laughs> you insisted a lot. That's not true. I never insist. I only ask, handsome. Although I couldn't believe it, it was the first thing that came to my mind. Eric was cheating on me, but it couldn't be. It was our wedding day. We were about to get married. In silence, I tried to open the door. Surprisingly, this one didn't have a lock, so I opened it wide enough to see inside the room. 
There, standing by the bed, was my fiancé, accompanied by a woman. At that moment, I felt like throwing up from the impact, but I held back and continued to watch them. Come on, handsome, let's begin. The woman pushed Eric and made him fall on the bed. Then, she sat on top of him. I'll be up. I was devastated. It couldn't be, but it was. I was angry, sad, confused, jealous. I wanted to do something, anything, but I couldn't. I was frozen, processing everything that was happening and what would happen next. The woman moved closer to Eric's face, but before kissing him, she stopped. Aren't you sad about your fiance? Aren't you thinking about her? What? Does that turn you on or something? Is that what this is all about? No, handsome. <laughs> this is about you being a cheater. I'm not. I, I love Michelle. I just want to have some fun before I get married. Really? We've been together for a long time. I, I just wanted... You know what? Get away, Monica. Eric tried to push the woman away, but she wouldn't let him. Accept it. You're a cheater. All men cheat. You are just like him, like my ex-fiancé. Suddenly, the woman, apparently named Monica, pulled out a knife and began stabbing Eric in the chest and stomach. All men cheat. They're all the same. They never reject me. They all cheat. I have to kill them all. I have to kill them. <laughs> in just a few minutes, the situation had completely changed. My fiancé, the one who was cheating on me, was being stabbed by his mistress. Meanwhile, I watched the scene from the door. I was shocked. I couldn't even scream. Die! 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 You unfaithful man! <laughs> the bed was already covered in Eric's blood, and he was no longer speaking, not even moving. He was dead. Excuse me, what are you looking at? Please stand back, spying is highly inappropriate. One of the cleaning ladies found me looking, and since I didn't respond, she pushed me away. Excuse me, there is a woman here who is, uh... Ah! After the woman saw the murder scene, she called the police. In a few minutes, a lot of patrols were heard arriving. Of course, Monica was immediately arrested. My aunt found me in shock. I didn't speak. I didn't move. It took several hours for me to react, and several days for them to tell me how the situation had ended. Eric had died back at the hotel long before the ambulance arrived. Meanwhile, Monica was in jail. She had confessed, although it was obvious that she was the killer. Still, her confession surprised me. The woman stated that she had freed me from that man. She said that since her ex-fiancé had cheated on her on her wedding day, she had opened her eyes. She believed that all men cheat, and therefore she must kill them to free us all. I don't know how to tell this story because not many people will believe me. Or even if they do, they will be grossed out with this incident that happened with me and my roommate, Tim. Tim and I shared an apartment in California. We worked in the same company, and he was the only cool guy in the boring IT sector. We used to go drinking and clubbing every weekend. One weekend, we decided to go on a short trip. Two bachelors planning to hit the town, hence the obvious choice was Vegas. We boarded onto the flight, and when we checked into the hotel, it was last evening. The prime hours of Las Vegas were unraveling with glory. We freshened up and came out to the streets to have a fun night. Don't you just want to stay here forever? No wonder people go crazy about Vegas. Wherever our eyes went, we could see the bling. The neon lights were everywhere, be it a pub, a hotel, a casino, just everywhere. We planned to go to a casino and try some gambling and then visit a strip club. I mean, yeah. We are in Las Vegas for the first time. What else do you expect? Tim pointed out a big casino right next to a huge water fountain. 
we sat down at our slot machines and started gambling. Both of us, surprisingly, started to win, so all our eyes were stuck to the screen. We must have played for half an hour straight when I noticed a man standing at some distance and watching us. Upon eye contact, I casually smiled at him. Receiving this gesture, the man suddenly got up and came to talk to us. His hair looked shiny like it had a lot of gel on it, and his clothes looked very expensive. He smiled, and I could see a pair of gold teeth shining in his gum. Care for a drink, gentlemen. Tim looked up hearing his voice and then looked at me with an awkward face. I replied, Uh, yeah, I could use a drink. Tim, what about you? Yeah, I'll, I'll drink too. We both got up so that we don't lose all the money that we luckily won. The man took us to the bar at the other side of the casino and ordered a martini for us. I had no idea who he was or what he did for a living. I was sure he is some rich dude capable of spending money on others. We started drinking the finest cocktails we probably had in our lives ever. I am Rupert Cardwell. This is my casino. This is your first time in Vegas? Yeah, sudden weekend trip. I see. So you two just want to spend your first night at Las Vegas gambling and drinking? Um, uh, what do you mean? I mean, don't you young fellows want to have some real fun? Tim and I exchanged looks, not having a clue what Rupert was talking about. Understanding our dilemma, Rupert grinned, flashing his gold teeth once again and said, I have a fun allotment located in the basement. It's not for everyone, just some special customers. You can have drinks and meet some of my best girls. They know how to take care of young fellows like you guys. <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> Tim and I realized he was talking about strippers and honestly, it didn't come as a shock to us. We anyway planned to visit someplace like that so we awkwardly smiled. So what's the payment structure? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not a pimp, guys. You don't have to pay me. You just have to enjoy it. Have fun. That's all. Come on. Follow me. Saying this, he started to walk towards the left side of the casino. I whispered to Tim, Is this happening? What if they try to rob us? What? He owns way more money than our families combined. Stop being so fussy about everything. You heard him. Let's enjoy. Like sore tooth aching in gum. Something at the back of my head kept telling me it wasn't a good idea to follow this guy. We stopped in front of a big wooden door that led to the basement of the casino. Opening the door with a weird smile, he said, Be my guests. Stairs went down, enlightened with red neon lights. Walking down, we reached a narrow hallway with a room on both sides. The man clapped twice, and the first door on our left opened. A girl with red curled hair and purple shiny eyes came out from that room. She was wearing night suits that revealed her figure perfectly. Needless to say, she flickered a fire in our hearts. Welcome, darling. She then knocked on the door on the opposite side and caked out to a girl named Sophia. Now, Sophia was even more beautiful than her. Her chocolate-covered skin with black long braided hair made her look like an enchantress from some exotic land. The red-headed woman pointed towards me and whispered something into Sophia's ears. They both chuckled enticingly, and then Sophia came to me. Will you be my knight in shining armor? What? Um, I fumbled and couldn't speak. The red-headed woman then grabbed Tim's hand and went back to her room. Sophia did the same too. And Rupert smiled and left with a joyful face. I sat down nervously while Sophia gave me a glass of wine. I took one sip of it, and it tasted awful. She came close to my face and said, I'll be right back. Don't forget to finish your drink. She went to the washroom. I didn't want to drink anymore, so I secretly emptied the glass on the plant kept at the table near her bed. Suddenly, the lights went off, and a red neon light lit up inside the room. The washroom door opened, and I saw Sophia walking to the bed and slowly lying on it. I couldn't see anything clearly as the weird red light blurred my drunk vision. Come on, love me now. I heard her enchanting voice one more time and lay on the bed to kiss her. I went to kiss her, but I got close. 
A foul smell choked my nose. The smell was of a strong chemical. I touched her cheeks and her face felt so dry and cold. What happened? Kiss me. But this time as she spoke, I realized her voice was coming from some distance. Like I was in bed with someone else and she was speaking on behalf of that person. Not realizing what the hell was going on, I looked up at the ceiling and saw a camera recording me. Getting all freaked out, I jumped from the bed and turned on the flashlight on my phone. What I saw made me vomit right away. Sophia was nowhere in the room, like she left from a secret door. Instead of her, there laid a dead, rotten corpse of a girl. The body was soaked in chemicals for preservation, which almost turned it into a mummy. Turn off the light. You're ruining the mood for our audience. What? What the hell is going on here? Just do it. Make love with it like it's an actual girl. Mr. Rupert will pay you well, I promise. So this is what they do? Record bizarre films based on necrophilia? And for that, they drug innocent young men and bring them here in this basement? I stormed out of the room and started yelling for Tim. Tim! Tim, we have to go now! I kicked the door open of that room where the red-headed woman took Tim to. And what I saw numbed my senses in one wink. Tim was kissing a corpse in some sick state of ecstasy. He had no idea it wasn't a real girl. I didn't have to guess that he drank the same drink that I was offered a few moments back. Tim, stop it, stop this filth. I ran towards him and started pulling him away from the corpse. He was out of his senses, but somehow I grabbed him and ran upstairs. I heard the redheaded woman yelling at Sophia. I told you, never leave the room. I have other clients. I can't keep watch on everyone. Sorry, but it makes me disgusted to watch what they do here. I promise it won't happen again. Someone stop them! My shirt was unbuttoned. Tim was only in his trousers. We stormed out of the basement and into the casino. Everyone looked at us like a pair of drunks who couldn't handle Vegas. But I didn't stop for anyone. I ran carrying Tim. Thank God he was slim back then. We came out of the casino and never looked back. I can't explain how we returned to our hotel. Tim vomited the entire night after having that weird drink, and I sat in the corner of the room, speechless and shocked. I don't think I will ever go back to Vegas. It wasn't about that Rupert guy or those two girls. What disgusts me the most is that they have a certain audience to enjoy such filth. Like, literally, humans making love to corpses. Bloody hell! I was the first to want to notice an extra person had joined our group. I counted six of us sitting around the campfire, but I knew we had left home with five. The sixth person had joined us somewhere along the way, but where and when exactly, I couldn't be sure. All the glowing faces looked familiar, like I had known them for a lifetime. That's why it took so long to find the man out of place. I had to go through the faces one by one. I went through my history with them, recounting how I met them, how I knew them. I fit each one into my memories like puzzle pieces. First, there was Mark. He was sitting next to Sarah, chatting her up as always. Then there was Ben. We had been best friends since the first grade. He had his arm around his longtime girlfriend, Justine. And then there was the sixth face, the piece that did not fit. I stared at him and his name escaped me. That is, if I ever had it in my memory banks in the first place. He looked familiar, but I could not place him in my memories. But why, if I recognized him, could I not remember his name? Why did he sit among us, acting as if he belonged? He stared at Mark and Sarah as they chatted. He laughed when they laughed, smiled when they smiled. Yo, Porter, Ben pulled me from my thoughts. Your head up in the clouds or something? I was just telling Justine about our fifth grade teacher. What's her name again? Mr. Smith, I said. Oh, yeah, Mr. Smith. I was just telling Justine how you could rile that guy up like nobody else. Remember that time you handed in an assignment printed in yellow ink? Ben and Justine smiled. <laughs> yeah, I remember, I said. 
They laughed again and joined in half-heartedly. When I glanced in the strange man's way, he was watching us, grinning. He was always watching, always on the periphery, never partaking. Part of the reason he had flown under the radar. I was struck with the sense that he was studying us. My skin crawled. Ben drained his beer and threw away the empty can in the cooler. Well, I gotta take a leak, he said and walked into the woods, swallowed up by the dark. You know how to push people's buttons when you want to, huh? I shrugged. I was having trouble focusing on the conversation. The weight of the situation, the reality of it, was starting to hit me. A strange man had attached himself to our group unnoticed. And who the fuck knew what his motivations were? Questions raced through my mind. None I could answer. The strange man stood with jerkiness. I gotta take a leak. It was the first time I heard him talk. He spoke with an odd lisp. It sounded as if he had to force words from his throat. He walked with an awkward gait, and like Ben, disappeared behind the dark veil of the trees. No one else flinched. Justine kept talking. I always loved the long relationship you and Ben have. It was so hard, moving cities and leaving all my old friends behind. I mean, I can't complain too much. I wouldn't have met Ben and all you guys otherwise. Justine, do you see what's going on here? Huh? You're telling me you haven't noticed. Notice what, Porter? What are you talking about? Who was that guy? I gestured to the vacated spot the strange man left behind. Oh, him. He's, uh... She trailed off. She frowned into the fire. I could see her mind ticking over, and her eyes twinged with concern. I knew I wasn't going crazy. I don't know. She said. Who is it? That's why I'm trying to figure it out. We stared at each other. Maybe... Justine was cut off. An ear-piercing scream came from the woods. It sounded like a shrill injured cat. A large cat. The sound split through the air and cut our conversations short. A blanket of silence fell over the four of us. Only the crackling campfire persisted. The woods were still and quiet. The fuck was that? Mark broke the silence. I don't know. Sarah said. I've never quite heard an animal like that before. Sounded like some fucked up mountain lion. Justine said. You ever heard anything like that before, Porter? I shook my head. My fingers tingled with adrenaline. Ben was still in the woods, and the strange man was out there with him. Dread filled my gut. There are no mountain lions out here, Mark said. It's probably an elk. They can make the same creepy sounds. Sarah agreed. Justine bit her lip and scanned the woods. It's probably okay. I think Mark's right, I said to her, but I wasn't sure I believed it. Mark and Sarah had started up their conversation again when the strange man bumbled out of the woods. They paid him no mind. I was hoping something would have triggered in them by now, but they were oblivious. The strange man took a beer from the cooler. He fumbled with it, struggling with the tab. It was as if he had never opened a can before. When he finally had it open, he sat, beer in hand, and continued to watch Mark and Sarah, a thin smile on his face. He never did take a sip. I watched him from across the campfire, his head wavering behind the heat. I touched on what made me uneasy about this strange man, aside from the fact he had managed to infiltrate our group without any of us noticing for a long time. He moved with jerkiness and awkwardness, like a newborn animal. Nothing he did was smooth or well-practiced. It made everything he did look like an act, an imitation. I didn't make the connection at the time, but I should have seen this man was not quite human. But at that moment, I wasn't sure what to think. I guess I just thought he was a freak. I considered calling him out then and there. I wanted to ask him just what the fuck he was doing, but I'll admit it, I was scared. I had visions of this guy being some horrific serial killer, and I didn't know how dangerous he was or if he was armed. I didn't want to push him into doing something drastic that got us all killed. As time went by without any sign of Ben, I became convinced the strange man had done something to him. I watched him plotting, planning, and marking his next target. Anger sprouted from my fear, and I started to see red. I needed to stop him. We used an axe to chop firewood for our campfire, and it was leaning against my seat. This man was dangerous. I was sure of it. 
I convinced myself I needed to do something before another one of us was next. I clutched at the axis handle. The smooth wood felt reassuring in my hand. Justine touched my arm. Porter, where's Ben? I'm getting nervous. It's okay. I lied, patting her hand. I'm sure everything is okay. I stood with axe in hand. I'm going to get some more firewood. I announced more awkwardly than I hoped. Uh, okay, dude, Mark said. Porter? Justine's voice wavered. Speaking up was a mistake. I had drawn the attention of the strange man. He suddenly stood up, and I saw his face for the first time. It was like looking into a mirror. It was me. All this time, I was looking at myself. Like me, he too had an axe on his hand. He then started walking up to each of my friends and struck them with that axe. All my friends were just sitting there like statues, as if they were waiting to be killed. One by one, he slaughtered them all and then gave me a crooked smile. Stop! Stop it! Why are you killing them? Please, just stop! Tears rolled down my cheek, and I collapsed on the ground. Hey you, get up! Your food is here! Get up, inmate! I opened my eyes and saw myself lying inside a prison cell. A slight ray of sunshine peeked in from the small cell window. A prison guard stood on the other side of the cell with an annoyed face. He slipped in a tray with food and said, I wonder how you sleep after murdering your friends. Bloody psycho. I'll be the happiest the day you'll be hanged. People like you scare the shit out of this world. be alive after what just happened to me. My life was normal, like every other 24-year-old, living in a normal house, earning through a normal job. But who can predict the future? I am Emma, and this is my story. I was an only child, and my parents raised me with pure love and care. After moving out, they shifted to New Orleans, and I came to Ohio. My once classmate, Philip Hoffman, helped me to get a job in his brother's advertising agency. I was more than happy the day I got my first paycheck. I rented a small house, turned it into my home with old furniture from a garage sale, and planned to earn a lot of money so I could travel the world. But life rarely goes the way you plan it. I lived in a quiet neighborhood and mostly kept to myself. I'm not much of a talker, and I have always been an introvert since I was in school. The only man I talked to at times was Mr. Prickly, my next-door neighbor. After his wife's death, he was living alone in his big house, but he was a kind man. Every morning, while leaving for the office, I would see him sitting on his porch, sipping coffee. He would greet me with a joyful smile, and I'd wave at him while doing the same. This was more or less my usual start to the day. On weekends, I preferred staying home and watching Netflix and eating junk food. At times, I joined my colleagues for a drink at a pub near the highway. So last Friday, when I was leaving for home after finishing work, my colleagues asked me to join them for a drink. Even though I turned them down at first, they kept pestering me. I eventually agreed, having no other option. We all went to the pub, had a couple of drinks, and ate some chicken wings. I was feeling a bit tipsy, and I didn't want to overdo myself. I would have taken a cab, but I remembered I had to pick up some groceries for my weekend self-enjoyment. One of my colleagues dropped me off at a gas station at 11.30 p.m. I planned to do a little shopping from there and walk home, which was no more than five or seven minutes away from there. 
The only issue was I had to walk amidst the woods. I know it sounds like a bad idea, but I had done this many times before, so I didn't expect any trouble that night either. The man who runs the gas station was also familiar to me. His name was Ralph, and every time I went there to buy groceries, he would always crack a silly joke to make me laugh. I entered the gas station, thinking, here comes another stupid joke, but instead was greeted by a skinny, freaky-looking old woman. She barely had hairs on her head. Because of old age, they seemed to be falling out, exposing her pale, white skull. Her teeth were stained, and her eyes looked gloomy, yet sharp. Good evening. Oh, hi. I was looking around the store in confusion when she spoke again. You weren't expecting someone else, were you? Nothing like that. I always see Ralph, so... Then you must be Emma, right? Yeah. Do we know each other? No, but I have heard quite a lot about you from Ralph. He fell sick, so I'm covering for him tonight. I see. And you are? I'm his mom, Ruby. Feel free to look around and call me if you need help. I smiled awkwardly and grabbed a shopping basket. Something about this woman didn't give me a good vibe. It felt strange that being so old, she was left to look after the gas station at such a late hour. But it was none of my business, so I walked to the shelves and grabbed the things I needed. I could feel her eyes on me the entire time. She was watching me like a hawk. When I finally headed back to the counter, she gave me an ear-to-ear -ear grin and said, Will that be all? Yes. I gave her the basket and she started billing. I was searching my bag for my wallet when she asked me an unexpected question. Are you married? Um, no. So do you wish to marry or just fool around? What? What do you mean? You know what I mean, Emma. Girls these days are much smarter than in my time. Do your parents know that you're a whore? Excuse me? You don't have to be ashamed of that. You are attractive, and women also have needs. Look, I have no idea why you're saying all this to me, but you should watch your tongue, lady. <laughs> You are one hell of a bitch, Emma. You expect me to respect you when you're trying to take away my son? My only son? The only human being left in my life. How do you sleep at night, Emma, knowing that you're snatching a son from a sickly old lady? Saying this, she spat on my face, and I was completely taken aback by this incident. I stepped back in reflex and disgust and started to wipe my face with my shirt's long sleeve. Are you crazy? Why would I want to take away your son? He's my father's age, you crazy hag. Oh? Then why the hell did he take pictures of you on his phone? Why the hell does he talk about you so much? He is clearly in love with you, and you surely instigated him. My son wouldn't feel this way about you if you hadn't encouraged him, you dirty little slut. I was paralyzed with shock and fear. This woman is completely delusional. She can't even understand the fact that her sick son took pictures of me whenever I came to shop here. I was so terrified that for a second, I couldn't decide which matter I should be focusing on. The fact that Ralph is a creepy stalker or that his mother is a psycho. I was drunk and my head was throbbing from all these sudden revelations, but without wasting any more time, I went to the counter and said, while looking into her hatred burning eyes, to hell with you and to hell with your son, bloody psychos. But I wasn't ready for what came next. As soon as I said that, she lifted a huge chopping knife which I think she hid all this time, waiting for the right moment, and slammed it on my hand, lying over the counter. 
Even though I tried to move away, I was late. She chopped off my two fingers, and I screamed in excruciating pain. As blood poured from my severed hand, she laughed like a maniac. <laughs> now, you'll never be able to wear your wedding ring. You have no ring finger left. <laughs> I could have run away right then and there, and I knew she wouldn't be able to chase me. But something at the back of my mind made me furious, too. I snatched the chopping knife from her hand and cut off her left ear. She screamed like a wounded chicken and fell on the floor while I screamed back. I have no interest in marrying your son or being your daughter-in-law. She kept on screaming and I dialed 911 right away. Even though I survived, Ralph's mom lost a lot of blood and passed on the operation table. The cops found Ralph locked in his room. It seemed that Ralph was in love with me, but his jealous, crazy mother couldn't handle it. She wanted her son to live with her forever. So to take revenge on me, she locked him in his room for a week and came to the gas station every night. I bet she waited for me, expecting one day I would show up. And I did. The cops have enough security camera footage to prove my innocence. My parents have decided to take me away with them after I recover. One thing is for sure. I am never going to another gas station alone in the middle of the night. When I was 10, my mom got a new job. Hence, we shifted to Wisconsin. My dad bought this house in the suburbs and the neighbors seemed friendly until I met Mara. She happened to be our next door neighbor and my mom made friends with this woman pretty fast. She would come maybe twice a week and they'd sit around the coffee table on our balcony and just talk. One day, I was on the balcony with them. I'm not sure why I was there, but knowing me, I was probably bored. So we're sitting there, they're gossiping about who knows what, when my mom got up to get some cake she had baked recently. I remained sitting at the table with Mara, and that's when my life changed forever. Mara was a spooky looking woman. She was about 5'6", skinny, with long black hair, pearly white teeth, and big yellow eyes. Her eye color was so unnatural that it was unsettling to retain eye contact with her for more than three seconds. We sat quietly when all of a sudden she turns towards me. A creepy grin appeared on her face. Her bright red lipstick with bright white teeth made her look even scarier. She started to tilt her head slowly from left to right, almost like a puppet. And then she spoke. You ready to go now? I kid you not. Hearing her voice change drastically with the disturbing body language combined, a cold shiver ran down my spine. Wh what? You ready? While saying this, she pulled back a black rose out of her purse. That's it. She just took the weird-looking rose out and held it there. Her bony fingers, accompanied by long yellow nails, dangled in the air as she held the rose towards me. That was the first time I saw a black rose. I started sweating in fear when my mom came with the cake. Here you go, Mara. Try this. I baked it yesterday. Mara, almost as if someone pushed a button on a remote control, switched back to her normal self, putting the black rose into her purse without my mom noticing. I left the balcony, creeped out, but I was 10, so I brushed it off quickly. I didn't know something way more vile was waiting for me at night. My room is on the ground floor, and my window is maybe five foot high. I was never an easily scared kid, but that night, I don't know why, but a weird feeling crowded my mind. I would turn in my bed constantly and look at the window every five minutes. It was getting late, and I started to doze off slowly. Before falling asleep, I decided to look into the window one last time. And there she was, standing in the freaking window. Mara, just standing, looking directly at me. The moonlight fell on her, illuminating the same grin I saw on her face in the morning. Her red lipstick was smudged and stained her white teeth. I was paralyzed with fear. I often imagined 
what I do in situations like these, but I always had an escape plan for any hypothetical I threw at myself. But now, when our psycho neighbor was staring at me through my window at 3 a.m., just smiling, I was motionless. My mouth got dry. I got goosebumps, and I could swear I could feel my room temperature drop to minus. After being like this for a minute straight that felt like an eternity, I finally gathered the courage to get up. I started walking towards the door with trembling feet while sweating like a dog. As I kept moving, Mara's evil yellow eyes followed me in a slow but cringing motion. Slowly, slowly, slowly with a grin still there. Again, it was as if she were a puppet. I wanted to scream for my parents, but my voice somehow died that time. I raised my hand to grab the doorknob and froze. I froze because she moved. She lifted her skinny hand that held the same black rose. I hope you're ready now. Hearing that same spine-chilling voice coming out of an adult woman, I was on my way to pee my pants. Please, just leave me alone. As soon as I said that, her smile disappeared, and an angry frown took its place. She nodded her head from left to right, gesturing no. Then, she grabbed the window pane, but every move she made was so slow, so mechanical, she started charging the window with both of her hands, and I realized she was trying to get in. I was so horrified witnessing this scene that I forgot to react for a while. The window slid open, and she shoved her head in from the gap. I quickly realized the impending doom and grabbed my door to get away from my room, but based on my luck, the doorknob was stuck. I was freaking, panting in fear, trying my best to unlock the door, but it didn't budge. While Mara was halfway through and screaming in that freaking child voice, You're coming with me. <laughs> you will be my final one. Suddenly, the door slammed open and I ran out of my room, screaming for my dad. My dad, being a light sleeper, jumped out of his bed and screams back at me, What the hell's going on? All I could muster to say was, Mara, window. While dad was putting his pants on, I ran back to my room, just to check if Mara was still there or not. You know how in horror movies, the person you saw is gone by the time the witnesses come? Yeah, something similar happened. Except, I caught Mara leaving. There was a house some 100 yards away from mine, and it had one of those motion-activated lights. I saw the light turn on, and a glimpse of Mara disappearing behind that house. By the time Dad came in, she was nowhere to be seen. After much talking, he decided that it was just a nightmare, and told me to call him only if someone physically comes into my room. You and your imagination he said walking away. Needless to say, I got exactly zero hours of sleep that night. The next morning, I woke up and found cop cars all in front of Mara's house. People in our neighborhood gathered around her house. I walked outside and saw two paramedics taking out something in their stretchers that was wrapped inside black plastic bags. Not understanding a thing and also not being able to spot Mara anywhere in the chaos, I stood there with a blank face. My mom and dad were talking to a cop, and when they saw me, they immediately came towards me. My mom was sobbing, and my dad looked very serious. He sat me down and said Mara has been arrested this morning. After receiving a complaint from a woman in an adjacent neighborhood, the cops came for a routine check and found everything that they never expected from this woman. It is said that she was involved in witchcraft. The cops have found four dead bodies of kids aged six to nine years buried in her backyard. With every corpse, she also buried a black rose. It seemed like she was running a satanic ritual for which she sacrificed those innocent lives. My mom hugged me in tears and my dad apologized for not believing me last night. I could see the pain and trauma in my parents' eyes. They were thankful to God that I managed to survive. There is no doubt that I was her chosen ten-year-old who would have completed her ritual. That's why she said I was the final one and that black rose symbolized death. Still to this day, I wake up at night covered in sweat 
with the fear that Mara is standing near my bed, tilting her head to the left with the same evil grin and saying, You're coming with me! (laughs) This happened when I was in my junior year at high school. We had a group of projects that we were given two weeks to work on. Our teacher let us pick our partners, and I picked my best friend, Peter. But we lagged, procrastinating the work for an entire week. When there were only three to four days left before submission, our rational senses finally kicked in. I asked Peter, Well, what are we going to do? It was after school, and we were hanging out at a store nearby. Peter replied in a worried voice, I mean, we have enough time to finish it. We just have to get together and do it. Then let's do that. We don't have enough time left. How about we go to someone's house and work on it there? I guess. But which house? My house isn't free. My aunts and uncles are coming to visit tomorrow, so we can't do it there. My place is too small for us. I share my room with my two younger brothers. None of our houses were available to work at. So we tried to pick out some places to work at, and Peter came up with an idea. Dude, how about we work in the school? We rarely get time at school. No, I mean like, let's go to school at night and just do it there. Don't they lock the doors? No, there's night classes, so the school is technically still open. What if we get in trouble? Get in trouble for what, doing our homework? No, I mean, come on, now that we have a spot to do our project, you don't want to do it? Peter was right. We agreed to meet up at school at 9.30 p.m., the same time the night classes started. When we reached there, we barely saw anyone in the school. The guards were also absent at the gate. It was so quiet and dark that I had trouble believing how cheerful this place gets in the day. Our classroom was on the opposite side of the campus. We started walking down the hallway. The only light was one in the very middle of the hallway. And although the hallway had windows, The moonlight wasn't very helpful. We tried to enter our classroom, but of course it was locked. So we decided to just do it in the hallway. We sat down on the floor and started working on our project. Dude, I had no idea this place could get so spooky after dark. Shut up. Let's just finish our assignment so we can leave ASAP. Why? Oh, you scared? (laughs) Brave Tommy is scared of darkness. Peter started mocking me like he always does, and I was about to throw a kick at him when we heard a weird noise. We immediately stared at the end of the hallway from where the sound was coming from. It felt like something was walking weirdly, almost like taking a step and dragging the other foot in a limping motion. In that light, shadowy atmosphere, we could see the wide, empty hallway standing before us. What the hell is that? What is that? I I don't know. I think someone's coming, here. We kept staring at the empty hallway, expecting to see any teacher or student any moment. But instead, we saw someone else. A man slowly came out from the left and he was dressed as our school janitor. The man was of average height and had a broom in his hand. There was something wrong with his left leg. He could barely walk. And I finally realized he's the one we heard limping a few moments back. At first, he didn't notice us and kept walking, but when he was in the middle of the hallway, he suddenly stopped, then sniffed the air in a very creepy way and turned his face at us right away. Even though I couldn't see his face properly, I sure saw his eyes. He had big, round eyes with gray pupils in them. He kept staring at us without saying anything. Not once his eyes blinked. Getting creeped out by this awkward encounter, I decided to break the ice. Hi, um, we're just doing our homework. Yeah, we'll leave as soon as we're done with it, Peter added. The janitor slowly walked towards us and stopped right under the hallway light. Finally, we could see him. Nothing was striking in his appearance except his facial expressions. He kept staring at us like he was doing all the time and then smiled ear to ear in a very unsettling way. He then spoke in a calm but shrill voice. Are you guys lying to me? What? Why would we lie? No one comes here after dark. Even the night classes students avoid this wing like a plague. I get so bored. Peter and I exchange a look, thinking how strange this man is. 
Look, we'll finish soon and leave. We won't cause any trouble. No, no. I'm not asking you boys to leave. Stay. Stay as long as you want. I am tired of being alone. Um, we better finish our assignment. Saying this, we got back to work, thinking the janitor will go away. But he didn't. He just kept standing there, holding his broom in hand and smiling at us. He didn't speak, didn't turn back, just stood there, watching us without blinking. Is there anything else? Nope. Just enjoying watching you guys. <laughs> Peter couldn't take his bizarre behavior anymore, so he said in an annoyed voice, Don't you have work to do? Cleaning and stuff? But I like it here, spending time with you guys. What? This is so crazy. Come on, Tommy. We'll finish the rest of the assignments at the night class wing. It's better to ask the teacher's permission to do it there than rather tolerate this creep. Peter, don't talk like that. We got up to leave, and I saw the man's face change. His eyes turned blood red, and the veins in his forehead started to pop out in anger. He started breathing heavily, looking at us. What? What did you call me? Creep, because that's who you are. No wonder you're alone. Let's go, Tommy. I knew Peter was being offensive, but at that moment, I too wanted to get rid of this guy. We turned around to walk away when I felt something bad is about to happen. Before I could guess what it could be, a huge blow came right at Peter. He didn't see the broomstick coming at him, and it hit him hard on the head. He grabbed his forehead, screaming and bleeding, and I saw the janitor standing right behind us, laughing in sickening joy. Ah, what the... <laughs> I'm a creep. I ain't no creep. <laughs> The world is people like you are who don't understand how to love and care for a lonely heart. But I know how to teach you all lessons. Saying this, he punched me in the face, breaking my nose. The guy sure was limp, but strong enough too. I collapsed to the ground, holding my bleeding nose. And then he grabbed Peter by the hair and started to drag him back to where he had came from. Peter kicked in the air and screamed, but the man's strength was way more than him. I was so jolted away with the pain that it took me a moment to get back on my feet. Finally, when the man was at the end of the hallway where we saw him the first time, I got up and started to run towards him. Having no weapon to defend myself or my friend, I grabbed the thin hair on his head and pulled it with all my strength. A chunk of his scalp came out, tearing blood from the roots. He let Peter go with this sudden attack and turned at me. He then grabbed my neck and started to choke me. His blood-red eyes hungered for my soul as he put all the pressure on my neck. My face turned pale for not being able to free myself from his grasp, and my vision started to blur. I realized I was going to die if I didn't do something quick. Peter was still on the floor, holding his bleeding head. The man's wide eyes that never blinked started to get wider enjoying the sight of my death at his hands. I don't know what came into me. I took out the freshly sharpened pencil from my pocket and stabbed it into his eyes. But the man was a psycho, even though he screamed and bled, but he still wasn't letting me go. So I started churning the pencil even after it was dead stuck in his eyeball. Blood and gushy flesh came out of his eye socket, and he finally let me go. I fell to the ground, trying to catch my breath, when Peter gave me his hand and said, Tommy, come on, we have to go. We both ran for our lives and went straight to the night class wing. The teachers and students got shocked seeing two boys in such conditions after school hours. They called the cops and the paramedics. Our parents were called too. Moments later, the cops arrested the janitor, who was lying unconscious in the hallway in pain. When he was taken away, he turned his face right at me and I could still see my pencil stuck into his one eye, which was completely gone forever. He still stared at me with his other wide eye and smiled ear to ear. I just hope he never gets out of prison. Ever. There was an old abandoned building near my house. Typical, I know. Anyways, there were hundreds of rumors and stories about this building. Some normal, 
some insanely out of this world. Some used to say an insane maniac lived in there and tortured anyone who entered. I've even heard that it's a portal to another dimension where nightmares come to life. The only consistent bit of knowledge was that whoever went in never came back. My best friend Samuel and I were huge enthusiasts when it came to anything supernatural or even remotely strange, so we decided to check it out. Since the latest disappearances, cops have been patrolling the area during the day, trying to prevent anyone from getting in, so we had to wait till night. At about 10.30, he came over to start preparing the gear. We made sure to pack some food, warm clothes, and my handgun, in case there was a homicidal maniac living there. We left the house around 11.30 to 12ish, and arrived at the building a couple of minutes later. The second we step out of the car, I notice an unusual eerie fog surrounding the building. Seeing that it was winter time, the fog wasn't new to the area, so I didn't think much of it at the time, other than it was extremely thick. We grabbed our gear and headed inside. The door was locked, so we had to break a window to get inside. We threw our stuff in, then climbed into the building. The worst mistake of my life. If I could go back in time, I would have never stepped foot in that hellhole. The first thing I noticed inside was how abnormally dark it was. Though we had LED flashlights, they didn't do much help seeing in front of us. We had about three feet range of vision, but we decided to explore anyways. Samuel was holding the camera and switched to night vision, but even that didn't do much good. I was holding the flashlight and had my hand close to my gun in case some deranged psychopath attacks from the darkness. As we reached the center of the building, I noticed a smell. Not a nice smell. I'm not quite sure how to describe it. It had a metallic tinge to it and slightly burnt my nose with each inhale. What's that smell? I don't know. It's hard to guess. We followed a long stretch of hallway that led to an open area. The big wall of that room was a huge hole that created a direct entrance into the house from the woods. Vines and saplings were growing all over the floor, ceilings, and walls as well. For a moment, I felt like we had stepped into a wildlife sanatorium. As I flashed my LED light on the hole in the wall, my eyes started getting blurry and my hands started shaking. The flashlight started flickering. Samuel tripped over something and the camera flew out of his hand. It slid a couple of feet, then fell somewhere in the room, shattering into pieces. We knew it was beyond broken, so we didn't even bother trying to get it. We turned the flashlight to the ground to try and figure out what Samuel had tripped over. As the light showed the ground, my heart stopped in fear. A dead deer was lying on the floor. It was torn apart. The body had been chewed on, clawed at, and ripped up. Blood was all over the floor. I immediately recognized the smell. So, it was blood all this time, but the smell was too pungent to have been from one deer. Taking a closer look at the floor, I noticed the blood is smeared all over the floor. Not only that, there were prints in the blood, almost like hands, but the fingers were too long. By long, I mean almost a foot in length, and they were pointed at the tip almost like talons. The prints were everywhere, on the floor, on the walls, and even a few on the ceiling. Oh my God, is this some kind of animal? I strongly believe we shouldn't be here, man. Yeah, but don't you want to know? Saying this, Samuel started to follow those freaky handprints. The prints all seemed to lead to one room. The door to the room was barely hinged, and the knob was completely torn off. My heart was racing. What the hell is in there? No animal could have done this. No living creature had prints like this. Shh, keep quiet. Samuel was confused by curiosity, and before I could stop him, Samuel pushed the door open. What we saw still haunts me to this day. Piles and piles of bodies, some still intact, others dismembered beyond recognition. Some animal parts were unmistakably human, the blood on the floor was about an inch high. There were the same prints on the wall and the ceiling. Suddenly, we heard footsteps inside the room, and I realized we weren't the only ones here. D 
did you, did you hear that? Someone behind us? No. I think... I think it's above us. My heart sunk right at that point. Samuel was right. With shaking hands, we both flashed our lights to the ceiling and froze in terror. A man was crawling on the ceiling, except he looked too disfigured to be called a man. His head was bigger than his body, and he had long pointy fingers that pointed into sharp claws. The creature had no skin, and we could see its veins and muscles popping out like a nightmare. The scariest part was his eyes. There was no pupil in them, just red plain eyeballs. The creature let out a demonic scream, opening its huge mouth, and we ran for our lives, screaming like hell. We could hear the running footsteps of the creature behind us. Whatever it was, it was hungry for our blood. Run, Chris, run! I was about to jump out of that broken window when I heard Samuel scream. I turned around and saw that devil had grasped him by the neck. It looked at me and smiled, showing its huge teeth. Samuel dangled into the air as the creature held him above the ground, and before I could do anything, it snapped my friend's neck like a twig. Saliva dripped from its ugly, horrifying mouth as it started to devour him. I couldn't wait anymore, because I knew he would come for me once he is done with Samuel. I ran home and stormed into my parents' bedroom, covered in sweat and tears. I told them everything that happened, and they called 911. Cops came and called for backup once they discovered all those bodies and the bloody scene inside the house. Samuel was never found, and out of agony, locals burnt the house to the ground. The cops ruled Samuel's case under the missing persons category, and no one believed me when I told them about this creature. A few years after this incident, I found out shocking information about that place. It is said that many years ago, during the time of the Russian sleep experiment, something similar was conducted in that house. It happened to be a prison for refugee criminals. I don't know if what I saw was real or not, but I am definite some twisted science experiment created this creature that still lurks in those woods behind our house. My sister and I planned to do her bachelorette party in Las Vegas two days before her wedding. We come from a bit of a conservative family, so we had to lie to our parents about going to Vegas, though her then-boyfriend David knew about our plan. My brother-in-law David is very open-minded, so all he said was to be safe and not go with random people, no matter how decent they appear. So, as planned, we reached Las Vegas by afternoon, went to our hotel, and freshened up. My sister booked us a spa and personalized beauty services. After two dreamy hours of self-care and love, when we came back to our room, it was almost close to party time. Like every other tourist, we too wanted to go to a club and have some fun. That's exactly what we did. The club we went to had drag queens performing on stage and girls dancing on poles as well. The environment was so exquisite and grooving that we got lost in all that dazzle. My sister was having tequila shots and clicking pictures with the drag queens. I was enjoying seeing her go all crazy. To be on the safe side, I only had a couple of beers so that I could be on my senses to take care of me and her at the same time. I was eating some barbecued chicken, sitting at the bar, when someone spoke from a close distance. How come a woman like you sitting alone in a Las Vegas club? Turning to my left, I saw a man standing tall and staring at me with a weird expression. His eyes were still and he barely blinked. Seeing him staring at me with such a freaky gaze, I got my red flag number one. Sorry, but do I know you? <laughs> Attitude, huh? Excuse me? I just complimented you. Why is it so hard to appreciate that? Saying this, he sat down right beside me and ordered himself a drink. I realized he is a pushover and won't leave so easily unless I make him. I remembered my brother-in-law's warning very well, so I kept a straight face. Thanks, but excuse me. 
Come on. Don't leave like this. Okay, I'm sorry for being rude. Can we at least talk? I promise. You will like me once you start to know me. Let go of my hand. What? Move your filthy hand away from mine, sicko. Seeing me all charged up, the man immediately left my hand and got up from his seat. He grabbed the beer bottle from the counter and smiled at me in a very creepy way. Hope you have a wonderful night ahead. Saying this, he walked into the crowd, dancing in the middle of the club. I sat down, exhaling a deep breath. I was shaking inside, but felt proud that I had handled the situation like a tiger. I chugged the remaining beer to calm down my nerves. My eyes started searching for my sister so that we could call it a night and go back to our hotel. The lights and music were so loud that I could barely spot her amidst the crazy partying crowd. After getting shoved and pushed by dancing drunks, I was making my way to the other side of the club when I overheard a familiar conversation. How come a woman like you sitting alone in a Las Vegas club? Seems like my boyfriend forgot about me after meeting the stripper. That's not good. He should appreciate beauty like you. Really? Turning in the direction from where the voices were coming, I saw that same creepy man talking to another girl who was sitting all by herself. He was giving those same cheesy pickup lines, but unlike me, the girl was too drunk to stop herself from stepping in his trap. She was laughing with that freak, not knowing his reality. I looked at the dance floor and saw my sister getting wasted. I wanted to take her back to the hotel, but I was worried about this other girl too. My instincts told me that this guy was way more evil than a casual flirt. Slowly, the guy got up, taking the girl in his arms. They intended to leave when he saw me watching him. He gave a filthy grin on his way to the exit. I might have let the matter go, but then I noticed something and my blood turned cold. As the guy turned his back toward me, I saw a small pistol peeking from his back pocket. Holy shit, he has a gun. Where the hell is he taking this girl? I called out loud to the girl, but my voice didn't reach her. Not having any other option, I ran to my sister and started yelling out of panic. Emma, that man, he's going to kill her. Please, we have to save her. Emma? What? What are you saying? Jenny, why do you have two noses and four eyes? <laughs> Double trouble. Shit, you're drunk as a skunk. I grabbed her hand and started pulling her. We left the club and I looked around for that girl, but I couldn't see anyone. Meanwhile, Emma was stumbling with each step she took. Suddenly, I noticed this parking lot and felt the urge to check it out. I grabbed my sister's hand and walked to the empty parking lot. There was a series of cars residing in that dark, stranded place. My eyes kept searching for the girl. Emma tagged along, not knowing what was happening. We were almost in the middle of the parking lot when I heard a low, sobbing voice. I followed the sound and saw that man tying up that drunk girl's hands and feet. She was laying on the ground, covered in dirt. Her one eye was heavily swollen that resulted from a punch. She was bleeding from her lips too. That crazy psycho must have beaten her when she tried to get away. I knew if I didn't tread carefully, this guy could shoot all three of us and escape easily. Seeing this incident, Emma realized the gravity of the situation. Her face turned pale and I understood that she was about to freak out and make things worse. I pulled her behind a car and told her, I have to save the girl. You hide here and call 911. Whatever you do, don't make any noise. Oh, okay. I tiptoed toward the man who started unbuttoning his shirt while saying vile things to the girl he was planning to assault. You know, it wouldn't have been you if that first bitch agreed with me. 
So once I'm done and you wonder in the hospital bed why this happened to you tonight, blame that bitch. If only she agreed to come with me, I wouldn't have approached you, my love. <laughs> Tears rolled down my cheek hearing his sick words. The girl's mouth was taped too, so she could only sob silently. It seemed like this man came all prepared. He started unbuttoning his pants, and this was the exact moment I was waiting for. Once he took off his trousers and placed them aside, I jumped and grabbed the gun without giving him a second chance. He turned around and saw me pointing the gun at him. I will never forget the way his face changed. A fear curled up into his eyes once he realized he is the target now. Come on, you won't, you won't shoot me. Okay, I'll let her go. Just put the gun down, okay? How long have you been doing this, huh? Tell me. Don't try to act smart. Sluts like you never live long. Saying this, he licked his lips and grinned at me once again. I don't know what happened next. Maybe his obscene words triggered something in me. I pointed at his left kneecap and shot him without answering back. He collapsed on the ground and flesh and blood splattered from his leg. You will remember my face for the rest of your limping, pathetic life. He passed out in terrible pain, and I heard my sister vomiting behind me, seeing the gore. The cops came within a few minutes and arrested the man. The girl's boyfriend took her home, and we too called it a night. I'm sure this man is a long-time offender. He probably picked up drunk girls from these Las Vegas clubs and molested them in every possible way. Whenever the topic of my sister's bachelorette party comes up, my family praises me like a hero. Honestly, I'm proud of myself too. You can defend yourself with a calm mind, even if the enemy appears to be stronger than you. Just remember that. Currently, I don't have a profile on any social media. The reason behind this is that I no longer have any interest in using them because I don't trust them anymore after the attack I received months ago. A few weeks after I moved to college, I realized something important. I needed some other source of income. My parents were making a big effort to pay for everything that was necessary, and I was very grateful for that. Still, I couldn't help but think that I was missing something. I wanted to party, buy things, and have lunch in nice places, but I just didn't have the money for it, so I started looking for work. Since I applied to several interviews without getting any success, I had a new idea. Work on social media. Some friends had told me about how much they earned on OnlyFans, so that seemed like a good option. I had everything. My body was slim and attractive, and my other social networks had many followers. I just had to create an account and start. But when I was about to do it, I realized that I wasn't comfortable exposing myself like that. I had nothing against women doing it, it was just that I personally didn't want to. Searching for some other options, I discovered that the traffic of images of feet on OnlyFans was high and very well paid. So finally, I did it. I created a profile. I advertised it on my other social networks and I started receiving money thanks to my beautiful feet. In the first few weeks, it wasn't too much, but I was fine with it. One afternoon, a large amount of money arrived. Surprised, I realized that a person had given me a tip. In gratitude, I decided to write to them. The username was FeetLover02. Thank you very much for the tip. I'm the one who should be thanking you. Do you sell exclusive photos? The question took me by surprise. I want one just for me. At first, the request made me feel a bit uncomfortable, but I soon convinced myself that it was a normal thing on OnlyFans. I finally accepted it and sent some exclusive photos to the person who paid me a good amount of money, which made me very happy. 
After that, every day, the user contacted me at the same time and asked me for a new exclusive photo. They are so fucking perfect. Perfection in a photo. Their comments gradually became more weird, but I just ignored them. I wish I could see them in person. The moment I saw that message, that's when I couldn't take it anymore. I don't do that kind of stuff. I could pay you lots of money. Their insistence made me very uncomfortable. I'm not going to accept. Please don't insist. I need them. I couldn't believe what was happening. Stop it. Unfortunately, it seemed I had met a weird and sick person. What's wrong with you, you sick bastard? Before I could block them, another message arrived. They will be mine in June. I panicked the moment I saw my name written on the message, but I felt even worse when I deduced that the person had to be one of my followers who knew certain information about me, for example, the university I was currently in. Overwhelmed with fear, I decided to delete my OnlyFans account and everything I had posted about it on my other social networks, which calmed me down for a few weeks. I didn't tell many people about the incident, as it made me so nervous that I preferred to just forget about it. But when I thought it was over, the exclusive images that person had purchased were sent to all my accounts. The accounts were newly created. Clearly, they were doing it to torment me. Blocking every one of those accounts didn't make me feel any better. In fact, I began to feel in danger. I became paranoid. I couldn't even go out with my friends or acquaintances because I didn't trust them. What if one of them was Feet Lover 02? What would they do to me? I couldn't get the last message they wrote me out of my head. They will be mine. Not me. They just meant my feet. The weeks went by and my closest friends became more and more worried about me. They said it wasn't healthy for me to stay in the campus dorm most of the time. I was still very scared, but one night, I finally agreed to go out with them. Even though I stayed alert, I was able to relax for the first time in weeks. It was really fun. Unfortunately, I was still suspicious, so when they told me they could walk me to my bedroom if I wanted, I said no and went alone. After all, the dorm was very close and I had bought pepper spray to defend myself. When I entered the dormitory building, I was hit on the head and passed out. Wake up, sleeping beauty. <sighs> My vision was blurry, but I was able to see a young man in front of me. He had his face covered. Did you sleep well? I hope so. With that energy, you might be able to handle what I'm about to do. What? Who? Don't you recognize me? I'm your good friend, Feet Lover 02. Or at least, we were friends until someone decided to stop talking to me. Right, June? After listening to him, I was finally able to fully wake up and realize the situation I was in. That young man had brought me to my room and tied my hands together behind my back. My feet, meanwhile, were tied to the ends of the bed. Looks like someone already noticed. If you don't mind, I'm going to put this on you. He covered my mouth with tape to prevent me from calling for help. I tried to scream anyway. Stop, or I'll be less nice to you. I promise I'll cause you more pain. My heart was beating very fast. I was terrified. This is all your fault, June. You had the opportunity to give them to me without it being against your will, but you chose this. This is your choice. <laughs> I looked at him while I remained still. He was beyond sick. He was absolutely insane. Bet you already guessed what I'll do. But I'll tell you anyway, Jew. I told you you would be mine. So, I'm going to cut off those pretty feet of yours. <laughs> Soon, they will be all mine. In the middle of the panic, I could tell that I had already heard that voice before, 
but I was so scared that I didn't remember who it belonged to. Enough talk. Let's begin. At that moment, I began to move my body as much as I could. I couldn't let him do it. I told you if you do something, I will hurt you more. I had to stop, because if there was a way to escape, it wasn't this one. Oh, my perfect feet. He just stared at my feet for a long time. He even seemed like he forgot about me. That's how I managed to figure out what to do. When he brought out the saw he planned to cut off my feet with, I let him. The pain was terrible, the worst I had ever felt in my life. But while he was distracted doing that, I untied my hands. There was a lot of blood by the time I managed to grab the blade I had kept under my bed in case I was attacked. Quickly, I stabbed the blade into the side of his torso, and as he writhed in pain, I untied my feet. I ran out of the room, screaming, as my mouth was no longer covered. The people who came out of their rooms were shocked to see the trail of blood that I left on the floor. After the incident, my foot was able to recover, but not me. Even if my attacker, the youngest son of a neighbor, had died that night, I wouldn't feel safe. For this reason, I deleted each of the profiles I had on social networks. I dropped out of university and returned to my parents' house. I never wanted to be alone again. Three years back when I was 17, I mixed up in bad company. From there, I acquired a habit of doing drugs, anything I could land on. I was living in my late grandmother's apartment, recently dropping out of high school. I was desperately looking for a source of income to suffice my necessities. One night, I think it was around 1 a.m., I was going nuts at home because I had no way to get high. I decided to go for a walk to the gas station at the highway and buy a pack of smokes just for something to do. If you don't have personal experience with addiction, this is going to sound crazy to you, but once someone embarks on a mission, they cannot stop. It's like there's a cold fire burning inside you and you have to bury it or you'll die. It's strange, gripping desperation. It's horrible to experience. So, there I was, walking down the stranded highway at 1 a.m. in the morning. Needless to say, I didn't see a single human being the entire time. When I reached the gas station, I saw a small car parked on the side. It wasn't hard to guess that the car belonged to the man who was working as a storekeeper. I entered the gas station and my eyes went straight to the counter. No one was there. The entire gas station was empty. At first, I thought the employee must have gone for a leak, so I started checking out the place. I randomly walked past the shelves when all of a sudden, a face peeked out. Looking for something, boy? Ah, what the hell? Jeez. <laughs> Seems like I scared you. I wasn't expecting someone to come out from the other side of the shelves, so for a second, I almost felt my heart stop. The man had blonde hair, back brushed with a lot of hair gel and crystal blue eyes that looked unsettling in his clean shaved, slightly wrinkled face. He kept staring at me with his glassy blue stare. I somehow got my shit together and said, I, I was looking for a pack of smokes. Okay, feel free to look around. When you're done, meet me at the counter. I'll be waiting for you. <laughs> now, the way he said, I'll be waiting for you, was a big red flag to me, and I made up my mind to leave this gas station as quickly as possible. I grabbed a pack of smokes and went to the counter. As soon as he saw me walking towards him, a sick smile surfaced on his face. So have you got what you're looking for? How much is this? Without doing small talk, I jumped to direct business. Receiving such a prompt reply from me, his face got serious. He took the packet in his hand and asked, How old are you? Um, I'm turning 18 next month. Why? You know I can't sell you these, as you're officially not an adult yet. I couldn't believe it. Is he giving me this age crap in the middle of a highway for buying a pack of cigarettes? My irritation crossed the limit, and I said, Dude, I can get many more of these things without turning 18. This is just a pack of smokes, so enough of your stupid nonsense. 
you don't care to respect people, do you? Seriously, it's 1.30 in the morning. Who cares if I smoke a pack? Just do your job, man. Why are you screaming at me? I'm talking to you calmly. Then stop annoying me and just take the money, bro. Fine. I will sell you this. Thanks a lot. But only on one condition. What? What the hell is wrong with you? You have to do something for me. <laughs> I was beyond furious, but at the same time, my withdrawals were making me paranoid. I needed to smoke and divert my mind, so I thought I should be on board with this creep. I was also aware of the fact that if he doesn't sell me those cigarettes, then I'll have to wait till morning, and there's no way I was going to do that. What is it I have to do? You have to kiss me on the cheek. What? Have you totally lost it? Look, I'm a very lonely man. So kiss me on the cheek and take your cigarette in return. I won't even charge you for the packing. What say? I can't explain how I was feeling that moment, but I started to scratch my arm to calm myself down. If you're familiar with the effects of withdrawal, this is what druggies do when they can't get high. The man looked at me up and down and said, So, have you made the decision? Now, what I'm about to say might sound completely disgusting to you, but like I said, I wasn't in the right state of mind. I thought, well, it's just a kiss on the cheek. I mean, if he wanted, he could have asked me to do more, but he just asked for a kiss on the cheek. I looked around with a nervous face. There's no one else, so no one will know. Then I noticed the security camera above the entrance. I'll... I'll do it. But you have to turn off the security camera. I can do that. Sure. His filthy fingers, covered in dirt, wiggled on the keyboard, and the red beeping light on the security camera went off in the next few seconds. He then turned at me and grinned ear to ear. Come close. It's time. <laughs> I was breaking inside. I could realize what addiction has done to me for a pack of cigarettes. I'm letting a creepy old man abuse me, but I had no way back. I was in deep shit. I slowly leaned on the counter, and the man raised his right cheek for me to kiss. I knew the more I linger on this, the more difficult it would be to do. So in one swift motion, I went to kiss his cheek and that's when he pulled out a bizarre stunt. Just when my lips were about to touch his cheek, he turned his face to me and made me kiss his filthy lips. It happened so quickly that I couldn't move away. His gooey saliva got stamped on my lips and I vomited on the floor. <laughs> You're worse than a girl, <laughs> bloody moron. <laughs> Vomiting over a kiss to the lips. <laughs> He went on insulting me while I was letting my stomach out. Tears rolled down my cheek, realizing I have lost my self-worth. The man blew more kisses in the air, staring at me, and went on laughing in between. His crazy behavior was beyond explanation. <laughs> Look how that little Barbie is crying now. <laughs> what happened, Barbie? <laughs> you lose your pony? <laughs> I just couldn't take it anymore. I threw a punch, aiming at his eye. He didn't see that coming, so my strong punch knocked him on his cheekbone. Even though my knuckles got hurt, I didn't stop. I threw the second punch on his nose, and the lower portion broke, spitting blood all over his clothes. I could see the nose being thrashed with my one punch. Oh, you jerk! You broke my nose! The man grabbed his bleeding nose and started cursing me. I quickly snatched the packet of cigarettes from the counter and ran as fast as I could. His painful scream kept echoing behind me. <laughs> I'll call the cops. I'll tell them you tried to rob the store. After injuring me, I'll end this incident. Don't you dare think you're gonna get away with this. Ah! But I didn't stop. I ran and ran, and his voice slowly faded away. I didn't sleep the entire night after getting home. One thing I was pretty sure, that he had no evidence against me. So even if he goes to the cops, and claims that I was robbing him, he won't have any footage to prove that. On the contrary, the cops will be suspicious of him 
for turning off the security camera all of a sudden. So, I was safe on that front. After that incident, I stopped doing drugs forever. I joined a rehab group, and now I'm working in a garage to pay my bills and live a clean life. And to the crazy man at the gas station, I hope we never meet again. I am currently undergoing therapy. Even though I know I will never recover from this trauma, I still have to do it for the sake of my parents. I know very well that my mental state will never be the same. I will never be able to trust a man in my life ever again. I was supposed to get married last month, but fate had different things planned for me. Robert Sullivan and I met at work. He was the handsome young guy whom all the female employees had an eye for, but he never showed any interest in any of them. I, on the other hand, was two years older than him and not so attractive in a conventional way. But I don't know why I caught his attention. The first time he approached me was during the lunch break, and from there, we started dating each other. He was so caring and charming that my parents liked him from the first moment they met him. Robert was always like that. Soon, our relationship moved forward, and he proposed to me on Thanksgiving. A bundle of joy rushed into my life and I knew I was soon to become Mrs. Sullivan. Everything was going perfectly until I met his family. Robert's grandma and sister came from Seattle a week before our wedding. I was feeling nervous as it was my first time meeting his family. The moment they entered our house, I could sense something weird about them. Robert's grandma had a very creepy face and excessively wide eyes, which were always watching me. His sister seemed weird too. She kind of ignored me and went to hug Robert. Once they both sat down in our living room, my mom struck up a conversation with his grandma. It feels great to finally meet the family of our would-be son-in-law. Gina is so lucky to have your blessings. Damn right she is. His grandma gave me a cold look while saying this. I walked up to Madeline, Robert's sister, and asked her to come with me. I took her to my room to get to know her more. The moment she entered my room, I saw her demeanor change drastically. So, you're a gold digger, huh? What? Don't act naive. We can tell you and your family are after my brother for our money. But understand one thing very clearly. My grandma and I will never accept you as a Sullivan. We don't let stray dogs enter our property. She slammed the door of my room on my face and went downstairs. Tears rolled down my eyes as I never expected anything like this. They didn't stay at our house and went to a hotel. Though my parents felt a little awkward with their behavior, they didn't say anything to me. Neither did I tell them how Madeline behaved. I was lying on my bed after dinner when my phone rang. It was Robert. Hey, babe. You didn't call me the entire day. Is everything all right? Why are you marrying me, Robert? What? What kind of question is that? No, I mean, seriously. Why are you even interested in me when you could get anyone else in the whole world? Because I don't want anyone else. I want you, Gina. Did my sister say anything to you? She thinks I'm marrying you for your money. Damn! I was expecting something like this. Listen, you don't have to worry about all this. I'm going to buy an apartment here for us. We won't be living with them anyway. It's just a matter of a few days. You are everything I want. Don't let them ruin what we have, okay? Okay. I love you. I love you too. Now get some beauty sleep. You are going to be the most beautiful bride soon. My pensive heart blossomed in joy. Robert's support brought back the smile on my face. The next morning, when I woke up, I heard a familiar voice downstairs. I came down and saw Madeline sitting in our living room, laughing and talking to my mom. 
As soon as she saw me, she smiled big and said, There comes my sister-in-law. Gina, you're late. Madeline's been waiting for you for almost half an hour. She wants to take you out to lunch. Isn't that sweet of her? Yeah, I guess. She walked up to me and hugged me, which I didn't expect at all. She then said in a calm voice, I am sorry for yesterday. Robert told me how much you mean to him, so I thought why not get to know each other before the wedding? What do you say? Sure. Great, I'll be waiting till you get ready. I went upstairs and got ready to go out with her. I guessed Robert told her about last night and she regretted judging me so quickly. We got in her car and she started driving. My grandma has cooked for us. She asked me to bring you for lunch. I hope we can start fresh. Aren't you guys staying at the hotel? Yeah, we were, but then we rented this house on the outskirts. Robert will join us too. We're going to have so much fun. Welcome to the family. I don't know why, but the way she said welcome to the family, something didn't feel right about it. We drove for almost 25 minutes and then reached a wooden house. Madeline took me inside and I saw a large table placed inside the living room. A red tablecloth covered it. There were candles all over the house, and Robert's grandma was standing in front of the table wearing a red cloak. Welcome. We were waiting for you. Um, what is all this? Where's Robert? I'm here, darling. I turned to the left, and Robert walked in wearing the same red cloak as his grandma. Before I could realize what was going on, Madeline grabbed my hair and started dragging me to the table. She was way stronger than I expected, and they all placed me on the table and cuffed my hands. I was lying like a pig brought for slaughter. What the hell is going on? Robert, what is this? Sorry, babe. This is a tradition of our family. The wealth we've acquired didn't happen to us overnight. We must sacrifice a woman every year to retain and flourish it. You see? <laughs> and Robert doesn't need to marry you. He already has me. No one is going to be his wife as long as I'm alive. Saying this, Madeline walked up to him and they kissed each other, shocking the hell out of me. So this brother-sister duo are lovers? What kind of a twisted, sick family is this? Out of hatred and anger, I screamed, You guys are sick psychos! Both of you are pathetic losers! No sane person will date either one of you! You bitch! Saying this, Robert punched me in the face, breaking my nose. Finish her, and let's leave for home before anyone starts looking for this lowlife. Madeline gave Robert a sharp knife while letting out an ear-to-ear -ear smile. You are going to die. <laughs> this is what you deserve, Gina. <laughs> Robert grabbed the knife, and a hungry look dazzled into his eyes. He raised his hands to stab me, but just then, a loud gunshot took place that splattered his brain matter everywhere, and his lifeless body fell to the floor. Madeline screamed at the top of her lungs seeing this, and we all looked in the direction from where the shot was fired. I saw my dad standing at the door with two cops. He rushed toward me. Gina, everything is gonna be all right now. Dad's here. The cops arrested Madeline and her grandma. Paramedics came and took away what was left of Robert. I didn't say a single word the entire time. I didn't come out of the house for days. My dad had run a background check on Robert and his family out of general curiosity. He found out Robert had three fiancés before, and all of them went missing a few days before the wedding. So, when he heard from my mom that Madeline came to take me out for lunch, his suspicion grew even stronger. He immediately went to the police station and asked for their help. They tracked my phone and found my location. It is disturbing to think that the Sullivans slaughtered three innocent young women out of some bullshit superstition. If my dad hadn't watched my back that day, I would have gone missing too, like those three girls whom Robert trapped in his web of love. 
I don't think I will ever marry someone. My heart is broken, and I have given up all hope of finding the man of my dreams. I love being a teacher, especially for young children. Ever since I was in high school, when I used to help my younger brother with his homework, I knew that's what I would do. Right out of college, I started working as a teacher's aide at a school, which is where I realized I preferred working with young children. They're sweet, <laughs> funny, willing to soak up knowledge like a sponge. When you offer them love and understanding, they begin to love you back, even end up giving you gifts like apples or cookies. Of course, there are always difficult moments, but once you learn how to calm and support children, those stressful situations become easy to deal with. That was how I worked for three years in a school and became a much-loved teacher. At that point, I thought I had already seen it all, but in the end, there are always things that surprise you. More than surprising me, there was an event with a child that still terrifies me at night because I am not able to believe that people like this exist in this world. It was the beginning of a new school year. I was helping in the preparations to welcome the students once again. These dates always excited me as I would have a new group of children in my care, perhaps even new students. Usually, in the case of younger children, the parents used to bring them to their class, give them a kiss on the cheek, accompanied by a few words of encouragement, and then leave. But that day, a little blonde boy walked into my class by himself and sat down, saying absolutely nothing. I didn't think I had seen him at school before, so I figured he was new and walked over. Maybe he hadn't said hello because he was shy. Hello, my little student. I'm Teacher Daphne. What's your name? My name is Noah Phillips. It's a pleasure to be your teacher, Noah. Better let me check the list first to make sure you're in the right class. I am. I know I am. He was right. According to the list of students I had been given, Noah Phillips was part of my class. Still, the way the little boy had spoken seemed strange to me. The security in his words was rare in him, because he looked more like an adult than a child. Maybe he was very smart, or maybe his parents had accompanied him and I hadn't noticed. Whatever the case, I tried to forget the matter. Perhaps it was a one-time thing. But over the next few days, I became more and more convinced that that was not the case. Noah always had his homework done perfectly, without a single mistake. When I asked him something in class, he answered without hesitation. He was very smart, that was clear. He was also well-behaved, too much for a child his age. Even the quietest student sometimes had fun playing pranks, but Noah didn't. He was extremely quiet, it seemed like he only spoke when necessary. I started to think that maybe he was having trouble relating to others, so I planned educational activities to play in class, but he didn't want to. He always stayed in his chair as far away from the others as possible. Every time another child approached him, I could see him getting tense and irritated. It was the only time his cold gaze changed to one of annoyance. Before reporting the case to the principal, I decided to take a closer look at him for a few weeks. I noticed that the circles under his eyes were getting darker and darker. During breaks, he would sit down to eat alone. His meals, oddly enough, always seemed to be prepared with great care except on Fridays. That day, he used to bring junk food, as if he himself had decided what to bring to school. His posture, besides, was contracted, with his shoulders hunched, but his gaze alert. At this point, I was very confused. I had never seen a child with such strange patterns. On the one hand, smart and responsible, 
apparently well looked after by his family, but on the other hand, cold, lonely, and irritable, showing no interest in playing with others. In fact, as strange as it seemed, it was hard for me to continue to believe that he was just a little boy. Already too worried about the new student, without any doubt that something was going on with him, I reported the situation to the principal. He, unfortunately, didn't seem to mind too much, but he still called Noah's parents to have a meeting with me. His mom and dad agreed to come on a Thursday after school. That Thursday morning, Noah was much more irritated than usual. He didn't let the other kids get close to him even a bit. When he started yelling at one, I had to intervene. Hey, Noah, calm down. They're doing nothing to you. You don't have to be violent. Would you prefer to eat inside the class? Only I will be there with you. Why did you do it? Excuse me? Why did you do it? I've been good. I've done all my homework. It's your fault. I hate you. Leave me alone. Noah glared at me with hate and resentment before walking away. I was shocked. I had never seen those emotions in the eyes of a child. Still, I left him alone. I was convinced I could help him after the meeting with his parents. When the bell rang at the end of classes, I stood near the school entrance. Noah was there too, waiting for his parents as well as me. At a certain point, a tall, blonde man with big eyes and dark circles under them approached the new student. Behind him was a short, red-haired woman with a neat appearance. They were definitely his parents. I did not hesitate to approach them, introduce myself, and accompany them to the office. Noah waited outside while I explained the situation to his parents. The man was looking at me strangely, without blinking. I was very uncomfortable, but I concentrated on speaking are very strange behaviors in a child, so I was wondering if... That's how he is. It's always been like this. Just leave him alone. Mr. Phillips, I understand that there are introverted children, but Noah is a case that... Leave our boy alone. Insisting was not a good option, considering that the atmosphere had become tense. Without remedy, I accompanied them out of the office. There, the man lifted his son with a push... I watched helplessly as he led him away by the arm. The next day, I turned my attention to Noah. This time, he seemed exhausted for some reason. But what unsettled me most was that when he looked at me, his gaze was as cold and threatening as ice. The boy seemed to have gotten worse, but I didn't know how I could help him. I had chills running down my spine all morning until it was time to go out to eat. Hey! Get away! Get away! Suddenly, screams began to be heard within the class. What's wrong? I just walked past you. One of my students was next to Noah. You are close. Very close. You touch me. Get away! The girl, surprised and confused, did not move from her place. Get away! Get away! In just a second, Noah grabbed a pair of scissors and lunged at the girl. All the students who were present started screaming. I told you! I told you! Get away! The boy began to insert and remove the scissors from the student's torso, who was screaming non-stop. I tried to get closer, to separate them as fast as I could, but by the time I got there, the girl's uniform had turned red, as had the floor. Get away! Get away! Ah! Noah! Noah was moving while I was trying to pull him apart, when I felt a sharp pain in my arm. I had managed to hold him, but he had stabbed me. Soon, more teachers arrived due to the screaming and called the ambulance. Some, frightened, also contacted the police which led to a police investigation. I can never forget what was discovered. It was in the news for a long time. They found out that Noah's dad was a murderer. When his wife finally confessed, it was learned 
that he was forcing her and her son to kill people. From a very young age, Noah had been exposed to death. The boy tried to control himself, but he always felt that pressure of having to kill, so he couldn't stand being around people. If anyone touched him, the boy would lose control and he would want to kill. My name is Robert Gray, and I used to be a truck driver a few years ago. At the time, I was recently given a new job to transport some goods. Now, this new job often kept me on the road late at night, as there were back-to-back -back deliveries, and my route was mostly on the outskirts of town. Due to being on the road most of the time, I often found myself stopping for gas. One particular night, I stopped at a strange gas station called Anderson & Sons Gas Station. I got down, put the pump in, and went into the gas station store. As I walked into the store, I felt a chill go down my spine, as something didn't feel right. For starters, there were about five people in the store, and they all sported black trench coats. That wasn't the only strange thing that I noticed, as they all hung their heads low, so I couldn't make out their faces. When I walked up to the cashier, who was also sporting something similar, the man said something very strange to me. Howdy there, friend. Would you like some dog soup? Shocked, I looked at the man with a baffled expression. To be honest, what bothered me wasn't the weird statement. No, what bothered me was the fact that the man was still saying it in this day and age. You see, the term dog soup was a popular slang used in the 1930s for a glass of water, and the only reason why I knew what it meant was because my grandfather used to say it all the time when I was a kid. After a few minutes of silence, I replied by saying, No thank you. After the short weird conversation, I continued to browse through the store. I then decided to get a chilled beer to drink later when I got home from work. As I took it to the counter to pay, the cashier said, you're driving, ain't you? You better not get scrooched. I had a bewildered look on my face as another odd 90s slang term was used because the term scrooched meant drunk. I was beginning to get scared now as I had an uneasy feeling. So I replied to him, no, just pack it up for me. I'd like to go now. I could tell the cashier knew that I felt uneasy as it was written all over my face that I didn't want to keep talking to him. So he said, no need to get all uptight, friend. I'm just bumping gums. And for the third time in a row, another odd 90 slang popped out of his mouth, as the phrase bumping gums meant making small talk. Alarmed now, I quickly took the bag and left. On my way out of the store, I wondered why the cashier was speaking like he was living in the past, as I was not sure many people would understand him in this day and age. And the only reason why I could understand him was because I was very close to my grandfather as a kid, so I picked up most of the 90s slangs growing up, as I used to love watching old movies and having long conversations with my granddad. I racked my brain for an answer to my question, but after a while, I decided to brush it off, so I entered my truck and continued on with the trip. I managed to deliver the goods in the next four hours that followed, and after everything was settled, I started making my way home. It was 2 a.m. now, and I noticed the truck was running out of gas again. I drove for a while before I came across another gas station. As I drove closer to the gas station, I had a weird feeling as the place looked a bit familiar. It was dark, and I wanted to get a better view, so I looked outside my truck's window to make out the name of the gas station, and before I could say anything, I froze, because staring right back at me, were the words Anderson & Sons Gas Station. For a moment there, I thought I was hallucinating, as I was sure that the location of the Anderson & Sons Gas Station was still a thousand miles away from here. I was scared, so I didn't get out, and I decided to find another one. So I started the truck and drove for about 30 minutes before coming across the same gas station, Anderson & Sons, that I had just left behind. I started to freak out as I thought my mind was playing tricks on me, but I calmed myself down and proceeded to drive in. Everything in my body told me to leave, 
but the gas tank was extremely low, and I knew the truck wouldn't last long enough to find another gas station. In order to calm my mind, I told myself that they must be a chain gas station, which would logically explain the numerous locations. So I got down from the truck, and I started filling the tank. Thirsty, I decided to go into the store to get a bottle of water, and as I walked into the building, I couldn't speak as my skin went white. Right in front of me were the exact same five people I had seen at the first gas station over eight hours ago as they all donned the same black trench coats and their heads were all hung low. It seemed like some sort of sick deja vu as my mind couldn't comprehend what was going on. I racked my brain for an answer, but there was no logical reason as to why I was in the same exact gas station at a completely different location. My mouth started to stutter the words, no, 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 as I slowly began to back out of the store. As I walked with my back towards the exit, I accidentally bumped into one of the people wearing the black trench coats, and as the man rose his head to apologize to me, I screamed. It is extremely difficult to describe, but the man's morbid face was a charred skull with pieces of burnt flesh dangling off of it. No words could describe the fear and horror I felt, as all five of them now faced me, and each of them had the same ghastly appearance. With no hesitation, I bolted out of the door and ran towards my truck. I threw the gas pump on the floor, and I rode at full speed all the way to the nearest police station. When I got there, I immediately rushed in, screaming, and the two cops came out to calm me down. They asked me what was wrong, so I began to tell them everything that happened that night. When I was done, they looked at me with a perplexed look and told me that I must be tired, which would explain why I was seeing things. I then firmly said that I was sure of what I saw. So in order to calm me down, the cops decided to pull a file on the Anderson & Sons gas station enterprises, but after their research, they had a shocked look on their faces as the gas station called Anderson & Sons hadn't been operational since the year 1934. The file stated that there had been a horrible accident that same year as one of their stations blew up in a terrible fire, killing only five people who were present at the scene, and apparently the aftermath and repercussions of the sad incident put them out of business for good. With nothing left to tell, I stood up, and left the police station without saying another word. The next day, when I dropped the truck back at work, the on-site inspector who normally inspected the trucks asked, How do you make it home without gas? Appalled by the strange question, I asked, What are you talking about, sir? I'm pretty sure that I filled up the tank twice yesterday night. The inspector then replied to me, Well, that's impossible, Robert, because the gas tank is completely empty and the truck shouldn't have been running. With no feasible way to answer him, I simply kept my mouth shut and walked away. The incident seriously took a toll on my mental health, and after a few weeks, in order to attain peace of mind, I decided to do some personal research on the strange gas station. After a few hours of reading through articles and documents, I came across a similar story online. Apparently, it happened about 30 years ago, in the year 1991, as an old truck driver also claimed to have visited the Anderson & Sons gas station. The story was exactly similar to mine, but the old man ended his own experience with, no one needed to tell me as I already knew that those poor souls were stuck here, doomed to appear and assist anyone looking for gas in the dead of the night. It all happened when I lived in that apartment. After the death of my husband, John, who for many years battled cancer, I fell into a deep depression. Everything in that house where we used to live together reminded me of him. The image of John remained crystal clear for every second that I was in that place. For some reason that we never found out, we were unable to have biological children. We didn't adopt either. Sometimes I regret it and think we should have, because maybe if we had, I would have had someone who loved him as much as I did. Someone who understood me, 
a person who would take me out of the loneliness in which I felt. But that person didn't exist. So in order to get away from the memories and deal with the loss, I decided to move to another city. While I managed to find a job, I had to use the money I had left wisely. So I moved to a small apartment on the outskirts of town. The building it was in had several other apartments, but most of them were unoccupied. That's how I ended up living on the second floor, with no neighbors around me. As time went by, I felt more and more comfortable in that apartment. I had even formed a friendship with the neighbors downstairs. So even though I got a job in a coffee shop with which I could afford a better place to live, I stayed in the building. But the charm of the apartment began to wear off the day the new neighbor arrived, Crystal. Like me, the young woman had come to occupy a second floor apartment. In fact, she had moved right across from me. At first, I tried to gently introduce myself to her. The day after Crystal moved in, I made her a little welcome cake. But when I went to give it to her, I don't want it. Excuse me? I said, I don't want it, Grace. Actually, I don't want anything. Just leave me alone. We don't have to be friends. Ever since that conversation, I couldn't help but think that there was something wrong with that girl. But I didn't want to judge her too badly, so I put the matter aside. I decided to leave her alone as much as I could, but that didn't stop me from bumping into her in the hallways or on the stairs. Although I watched her for a few seconds at a time, over the weeks, I noticed that she looked worse and worse. She had messy hair, dirty clothes, dark circles in her eyes, and small cuts on her hands. Since the young woman had made it clear that she wanted me far away, I decided to inform the landlord of the situation, but he didn't take it very seriously. He said that he preferred not to interfere in the lives of those who lived in his building, as long as they didn't cause any problems. As if we had called them, the problems soon began. As night fell for three days in a row, loud music from Crystal's apartment began to play. The first day, it just surprised me, but the second day, it woke me up from my nap, so I decided to go ask her nicely to turn it down. Although I knocked on the door several times, no one came out. By the third day, the vast majority of the neighbors had reported the situation to the landlord, who showed up that night to speak with Crystal. Please, all the neighbors have made complaints. Yeah, yeah, I got it. I'll turn the music down. But stay away, and don't you dare touch me. As I heard from the living room of my apartment, the voice of the young woman had sounded so altered that it seemed even aggressive. That girl really worried me, so I decided to ask the landlord what had happened. That girl. I barely touched her when I tried to look inside the apartment because I thought I heard something, and she went crazy. I was confused at his statement, but to my surprise, the answer came later that night when I heard two different female voices laughing in the hallway. Looking through the peephole, I noticed a young blonde woman with Crystal. They both entered her apartment, and that's when the music started playing. Even though it wasn't as loud as before, it was still able to disturb my sleep. Crystal? Crystal! After a few minutes of calling her, the door opened a little, hardly revealing one of the neighbor's eyes. Ugh, what do you want? The music won't let me sleep. The girl opened the door a little more, letting out her hands and face. Look, old lady. Crystal looked up and down the hallway before continuing. Her eyes seemed restless and nervous. I already took it down, so fuck off and leave me alone. Not letting me say anything else, she closed the door quickly, but not fast enough to prevent me from seeing the cuts on the pale skin of her delicate hands. Even if her insult had incensed me, since I felt she had been rude to my request, I was more concerned about the young woman than anything else. But again, when talking to the landlord, he ignored my comments. Grace, leave the girl alone. I think you're exaggerating. Day after day, I listened and watched as a new woman walked into Crystal's apartment each time. I was not against the love affairs of the young neighbor, but I was worried because her attitude only indicated 
that what I had thought from the beginning was true. Something was wrong with her. On Sunday night, the music woke me up again. Tired, I decided to try again to reason with the neighbor. I got up and walked to the door of her apartment once more. Crystal? Crystal? After knocking several times, the door gave way, but there was no one behind it. It didn't take me long to realize that it had happened on its own. Neighbor? The door is o- I didn't want to invade her privacy, so I just took a look. But what I saw, I could never have imagined it. On the couch in the living room was a black-haired woman with a large cut on her neck. In fact, her head looked like it was about to fall off. Her lost blue gaze looked in my direction, as if wanting to flee here. As expected, the couch and the rug on the floor were covered in blood. The loud music continued to play when a room door opened wide, revealing Crystal, who stared at me with uneasy eyes. Grace? Her voice sounded calm, which disturbed me because she was covered in blood. She glanced at the dead woman and then back at me. I saved her. That's what I do. I was terrified, but I couldn't move. I couldn't speak either. I was completely frozen. I have done this with all of them. <laughs> all of them were young and beautiful women. I was not going to let any man contaminate them. Listening to her, I realized all those nights of loud music, she had been murdering girls, one after another. Even if you are very old, I can also save you, Grace. Let me save you. Nobody will ever hurt you. I'm going to save you. <laughs> after pulling a knife out of her pants, my young neighbor pounced on me from one moment to another. We both fell on the floor of the hallway. Help! I was trying as hard as I could to keep Crystal from sticking her knife into my throat. Let go, Grace, she said the moment she cut my ear with her knife. Listening to her and feeling pain was like an engine that started my energy because suddenly I was able to push her away from me with one of my legs. Screaming, I managed to get downstairs where some neighbors had already come out to see what was happening. One of them called the police. In the following days, while I was still in the hospital, Crystal's case made the news. Apparently, she had been raped by a man from her close circle in her hometown. Her family and justice turned their back on her, so she escaped and came to the place where I lived. Experts declared that the trauma had been such that the young woman believed that she should save other women like her from that suffering. The heads of eight victims, plus the complete corpse of one, were found in her apartment. Many times, people have asked me how I have so many followers on social networks and how lucky they would be to have the same amount of people. A few years ago, I would have felt flattered and said that I am very lucky. But today, I know that it can be a curse. Being a popular girl on social media, one is exposed to all kinds of nasty comments. I lost count of men who said obscenities or asked me for nudes. That wasn't something I would do, but it was fun to upload provocative photos to my account. So, of course, when I discovered the existence of OnlyFans and the possibility of monetizing it, I created an account without thinking twice. After a few months, my account had already exploded. It was a total success. I was surprised by the amount of money I could earn doing something I like. Also, to my surprise, the clients were quite polite and reserved, as if the ones saying obscenities were just teenagers who couldn't pay for my photos. Among all of them, there was one customer in particular who always bought my photos. He started being polite, thanked me, and treated me well, until one day, I opened my inbox, not knowing that this day would be the last day I would use my account. Hi. I'd like to know what you do uploading such provocative pictures outside of OnlyFans. With all due respect, I don't think it's any of your business, I wrote, angrily. 
Yes, it is my business, since I pay to see your pictures. The fact that others touch themselves looking at your pictures for free seems very disrespectful to a long-time customer like me. I'm sorry you feel offended, but the content I upload to OnlyFans is different. If you still don't like me uploading photos to my normal account, don't buy from me anymore. Thanks. Listen to me, you ungrateful bitch. Do you know how much I paid for your photos? If I see you giving them away for free, then you owe me that money, and I want you to pay me back. Have a good life, weirdo. With that said, I blocked him and got rid of the problem. One of the advantages of anonymity is that if you don't like someone, you can block them. I admit that at the time, those messages made me feel really bad, but I tried to pretend that I was strong and say that it didn't affect me. I decided to go take a hot bath to forget about the jerk. When I came back, I would start studying for an algebra exam. When I returned, the relaxation I had vanished the moment I opened the computer and saw my notifications. My screen was full of messages, all from different accounts, with the message ungrateful bitch and my home address at the bottom. Panicking, I cried and blocked all the accounts and deleted all the messages, but they kept popping up. Not knowing what was going on, I received a video call on Skype and hesitantly, I answered it, turning off my camera. Do you still think it's a good idea to block me now, you little bitch? He spoke without the webcam, in a violent but arrogant tone. How do you have my home address? Why are you doing this to me? I said in tears. Because people like you deserve this. What? What did I do? Don't play innocent now. You're living to tease other men. You pretend to be nice via messages, then you talk to 20 other men. His tone denoted contempt. This man believed every word he said to me. We are nothing. I can talk to whoever I want anytime I want. Who do you think you are to tell me who I can talk to? You're wrong. We are something. I'm your client, and the client is always right. You shouldn't have blocked the client. You're a psycho. Leave me alone, or I'll call the police. I yelled at him. And what will you tell them? That a man is saying bad words to you on the internet? Let me give you a good reason to call the police. Then, the man turned on his webcam, but I didn't see his face. What I saw frightened me more than any other image. I remember how my blood froze. I was paralyzed with fear and I was so shocked that I couldn't even get tears from my eyes. This man's camera was showing my house. You shouldn't have blocked me, he said in a dry and low tone. Suddenly, I felt very dizzy and felt like throwing up. My head started to hurt as if it was being slammed against a wall. It was hard to breathe normally, and I started hyperventilating. I called the police as fast as I could without losing sight of the man who I could now see through my window, just standing there, looking in my direction. The police told me they would get there as quickly as possible, but I decided to film him with my cell phone in case he tried to escape. But when my camera was pointed at his position, the man was no longer there. Instead of him, I saw only my mother coming in after shopping. Mom, get out of here! Go, run to a neighbor's house! There's a man trying to break into the house! I shouted in desperation. She barely reacted to what I shouted. Her face was still one of surprise and confusion when, out of nowhere, the man came out of a bush with a baseball bat and started hitting her wildly in the body. Who are you? Help! Help! cried my mother desperately. Leave her alone, sicko! The police are on their way. They're going to kill you for this. Please, somebody help us. He's beating my mom. I screamed at the top of my lungs, crying both from helplessness and from seeing what they were doing to my mother. This is your fault, too. This is what happens to you when you raise a fucking whore. Do you like her? Are you like your daughter? She probably likes to be beaten, too. Please, stop. I barely heard my mother whisper, 
no longer strong enough to scream. Do you see this? This will also happen to your father, to your siblings and friends, even to the stupid cat you have in your room. This will happen to all of them if you ever send pictures of yourself to anyone else. Can you see this? This is your fault. From now on, you are mine and only mine, shouted the man while he was still hitting my mother, who had already lost consciousness. I was still screaming in despair, crying uncontrollably. Many of the neighbors were looking out the window, but none of them decided to come out and do something. I shouted at them, but once I looked in their direction, they went back to hide in their houses. Luckily, the stalker was so furious that he didn't see the police car coming, and when he did, it was too late. The man dropped his baseball bat and ran desperately, but one of the two officers caught up with him in a matter of seconds and knocked him to the ground. I will be back, you'll see. No bars are going to stop me. You're mine! He shouted with anger, but at the same time, some resignation. The other police officer stayed behind, calling an ambulance for my mother, who did not know if she was still alive. I ran downstairs with the officer, and when I saw my mother, I began to hug her, crying. A few days later, my mother was in intensive care. Luckily, she had only received a few blows to the head. So I assumed that everything that happened was a warning from the stalker, but it got out of control. Shortly after, I found out that the man had been released from prison. Fortunately, he was not released to the streets, but was again locked up in a mental institution. This person was still obsessed with me, screaming my name at the time of sentencing and as the cops took him away. When we returned home, we decided to move, and despite having quit social media, there is not a day that goes by that I don't look out my window in fear, waiting to see this man standing in my backyard, looking at me again. It all started on the 21st of July. I was an avid nature enthusiast, so I had planned a hiking trip with two of my friends, Alice and Isabella. We packed and got ready for the trip before making our way to the outskirts of town. My dad used to take me camping, so I knew a good, secluded spot that was deep in the woods. We made our way there, and by the time we got there, it was pretty late, so we set up our separate tents and went to bed. I don't know why, but I was feeling a bit uneasy that night, as I had a gut feeling that something wasn't right. I eventually ignored it, as I told myself I was just being paranoid, and after a few minutes, I felt my eyes close as I drifted off to sleep. I'm guessing it was about 30 minutes or so before I was awoken by the strange noises coming from outside. I tried to ignore it as I thought it was a small animal or something, but my gut told me to check it out. So I did. I was about to wake up Alice when she came out of her tent. She looked at me curiously and said, You heard it too? I then replied to her with, Yes, I thought it was a small animal or something. Now we had noticed that Isabella hadn't come out of her tent, and that was a bit odd, as we were making quite a ruckus. Alice then made a joke, saying, I'm pretty sure Isabella is the only human who can sleep through all this noise. She's such a deep sleeper. I laughed at the joke as I called out to her. <laughs> Isabella! Nothing but silence answered me, so I became a bit worried. Alice and I then made our way toward her tent, and as we opened it, we couldn't find her. No one was there. Alice immediately began to freak out, as something like this had never happened before. I started to freak out too, but I knew we had to do something quickly, so I calmed Alice down and told her that we had to look for Isabella. So we got out our torches and began to search the area. After a couple hours of searching, the sun began to come up. I was glad, as during the daytime we could see things clearer. We looked for her throughout the hours that followed, but we didn't find anything. I was about to give up when Alice yelled, I found something! I immediately rushed to her side to see her pointing at a pink cloth. 
The cloth was stained with blood, and I remembered that Isabella was wearing a pink shirt the night before. Fear gripped me as I didn't know what to do, but before I could say anything, a blood-curdling scream filled the forest. It stopped a few seconds after it started, but I could clearly tell that it came from the path straight ahead. Knowing one of my best friends was in trouble made me forget about my fear, so with no hesitation, I followed the path the scream came from, and Alice was right beside me. After a while, we eventually reached a clearing that had a large cabin situated in the middle. Slowly, and without making a sound, Alice and I made our way toward the cabin. We reached one of the windows and peeked in, and what I saw made my eyes tear up. Sitting on the floor in the middle of the room was our friend, Isabella. She was battered, bruised, and her left eye was swollen shut. Her shirt was torn off, and she was crying. The more I looked, the worse it got as I realized that she wasn't the only one there, as several other women were also in similar conditions. I began to wonder who would do something so cruel when my eyes finally laid sight on him. He was at the far end of the room, and he looked like the most repulsive thing I had ever laid eyes on. His eyes were bulging red, and his teeth looked black and rotten. To my horror, I soon realized that he was touching himself while watching the women suffer. The scene was sickening. He was getting off to the sight of the crying women. He looked like a psychotic sadist, and nothing but anger filled me. So without wasting any time, I told Alice about the plan I had thought up, as I knew we couldn't just barge in there. So I instructed her to grab the large rock that was lying a few meters away and throw it into the window. While she did this, I stationed myself at the door so that when he came out to check who it was that threw the rock, I would be waiting for him. In the tense moment, my mind remembered when my dad took me to a self-defense class in high school. It had been a while, so I hoped that it would suffice. I then muttered a short prayer under my breath and waited. With no hesitation, Alice threw the rock and it completely shattered the window. Exactly as I planned, the man reacted to the sound and he immediately started to come out. Once the door was opened, I used all the strength I had and punched him in the throat. He fell back, choking, and I swiftly landed another blow. I could feel the adrenaline fill my body as I went for another hit, but the man quickly moved out of the way, and I missed. I always find it hard to put into words, but the man I faced that day was like an animal. He moved so quickly as he landed a huge blow on my jaw. The sheer force made me fall to my knees, and within seconds, he was on top of me. He then opened his disgusting mouth and said, Now this is a first. Pray coming right to my doorstep. I couldn't be more happier. His vile breath made me nauseous, and I immediately wanted to throw up. He then hit me again, and I started to taste blood in my mouth. Anger and regret filled me, as I knew that this was it, and I had lost. But right before I lost all hope, I heard a loud thud, and my assailant fell to the floor. Standing right behind him was my friend Alice, and she held the large rock in her hand. I rushed to hug her with tears in my eyes as we cried. Our assailant, who was now laid out on the floor, had a bleeding head, but he wasn't unconscious. So I decided to subdue him as Alice went to help Isabella and the rest of the ladies. The man began to scream. No, this isn't right. The prey can't be the hunter. I am the evolved hunter. Unintelligent men spend their time hunting dumb and lesser animals. So I took it upon myself to evolve and hunt more advanced and cunning animals. And no animal is more cunningly evil than the ones called females. As he spoke and thrashed about, I realized how disturbed this man was. He hated women so much that he degraded them to animals that could be hunted as game. It filled me with so much anger that I blurted out. 
Well, you're going to jail, you sick bastard. And there, the only one who will be hunted is you. I saw terror fill his eyes as he screamed. No! Not jail! I can't hunt you dumb bitches there! I can't use you for my desires and kill you when I'm finished! No! Please! He tried to struggle, but the blow to his head made him weak and a bit slow. Seeing him beg after what he had done was pathetic, and I was sure he couldn't do anything now as he was losing a lot of blood. But I underestimated him as he kicked me aside, and before I could do anything, I watched him rush to the glass shards that were lying on the floor from the broken window. With no hesitation, he slit his own throat. I had no words, but for the first time in the last hour, my body finally relaxed, and I sat on the floor and cried. The cops arrived the next day, and the cabin was swarming with them. Over 40 women were found packed like sardines in the basement. 15 of them were corpses, and the remaining 25 all looked dead inside. As the search kept going, unspeakable horrors were found in the cabin, as the rotting head of a woman was found impaled on the wall in one of the rooms. I realized that it was similar to what hunters did with stags, but in a morbidly evil way. The psychotic man was identified as Sebastian Moore, a troubled man who killed his own wife by hunting her in their backyard. He had escaped from an asylum 10 years earlier and had been on the run ever since. After the case was closed, I was thanked by the Justice Department for helping to bring home and reunite all those kidnapped women, both dead and alive, with their grieving families. It's been over four years since this incident, and I'm normally called on to tell my story at survivor events. Retelling it now, it makes me remember a particular occasion where a girl came up to me after I had finished telling the story and said, That's a sad story, and I'm glad that you survived, but I don't know why you would go into the forest. I normally steer clear, because apart from the psychotic man that you guys ran into, there are already so many dangerous creatures like bears and wolves, so I always advise my friends to avoid it. I looked at her and laughed, because after meeting the man called Sebastian Moore, I realized that we human beings are far more dangerous than any so-called wild or dangerous creatures lurking in the forest. My name is Adam, and I'm a paranormal investigator. Along with friends, Elsa and Derek, we started a YouTube channel called The Paranormal Piles, where we explored haunted houses and places where evidence of the existence of an afterlife has been reported. To be honest, we never found anything. The most we ever saw were things moving or strange voices, but nothing too real. Everything could be an act of our imagination or just a simple coincidence. After a while, all the cursed places started to look the same. They were just abandoned houses or public places full of graffiti. The guys and I started to lose hope of finding ghosts and concentrated on making our YouTube channel look as real as possible. Even fabricating some of the scares or adding fake psychophone sounds. Everything was going well until one day we received an anonymous email from a viewer. The mail said that this abandoned house was the cause of the disappearance of more than 20 people and was one of the most diabolical places in the country. Searched the internet with my team. Not only did we see that the house was real, but that no one had made videos about it. We packed our bags and in just one day, we were there. We couldn't miss this opportunity. Wow, for a haunted house, it is sure well kept. Derek may have said it, but Elsa and I were thinking exactly the same thing. The house was pretty much the same as when it was built, according to the Google photos. Just a little dirtier. The place was very big and in the middle of nowhere, almost three kilometers away by road from its neighbors. After taking some pictures of it from different angles, we decided to go inside. The front door was mysteriously open, but the place was abandoned, so it didn't attract our attention. The house was very dirty inside, full of dust and spider webs. Other than that, it was in perfect condition. The furniture wasn't broken, and it hadn't been vandalized. 
The walls were painted a deep white that had turned to gray with dust. But there was no sign of any graffiti. Are my eyes deceiving me? Finally, a haunted house where 12-year-olds haven't been painting the walls. More respect to the 12-year-olds. They are basically our audience, I said with a joking tone. Hey, ghost of the haunted house. You guys are adults, right? <laughs> Follow us on YouTube. Derek shouted jokingly, and we all laughed. Well, how are we going to do this, guys? I suggest we take some pictures and do some tests here, and then go to the first floor. It looks a little more creepy. Hey, Derek, remember what I told you in the van. If I put up a doll or move something around, pretend you didn't see anything. That way, people figure things out on their own, and we have a reason to stay in the house. Whatever you say, you're royalty. We took some pictures and made up some scares. Everything was going as expected, and we decided to head to the first floor. But a noise stopped us. We turned around and saw a hooded figure locking the door, turning around and looking at us. No, you can't go out, he said to us in a mocking tone. Before we could react, five men were behind us. One of them grabbed Elsa by the neck and held her tightly, immobilizing her. Two others grabbed my arms and threw me to the ground in a very professional manner. These people were not vandals. They knew what they were doing. Derek, in a panic, looked around for somewhere to run. He took a few steps to the side, but two of the people in robes stepped out from the shadows and grabbed him from behind. Who are you? Why are you doing this to us? I shouted in desperation. When we're here, none of us have names. Little ghost hunter, I'm sorry. I can't answer that question. Let go of me, you fucking asshole. Come on, attack me one at a time. I'll kill you all and I'll shove the fucking hood up your asses. Derek shouted in desperation. Ignoring my friend's threat, the hooded man continued to talk to me. For your luck, Adam, I can answer you the second question. He paused to clear his throat and kept talking. The reason why we are doing this to you is that only you guys were stupid enough to come alone and unarmed to a house where people disappear. <laughs> Seriously, how did this seem like a good idea to you? We just wanted to entertain people. Ah, I know. And we have a lot in common. We also have an audience to entertain. What? Enough talk. Let the show begin, guys. And as soon as he said this, one of the men pulled out a camera and began filming Derek. Meanwhile, another approached him with scissors in his hands. Hey, what are you doing, you sick fuck? Get away from me! Let go of me now! I'll kill you all! Derek shouted, almost in tears. Without paying attention to him, the man walked towards him and plunged the scissors into his belly, making circles with superhuman strength. Derek was no longer struggling to free himself, so he was released. As he fell to the floor, the two people holding him plunged their hands into his abdomen, pulling out all the organs and throwing them away. I didn't know what was happening. I turned and saw Elsa was about to vomit, but quickly, the man holding her acted and put a sock in her mouth. The camera was on her now. She was trying her hardest to vomit with no success as she choked on her own vomit. The man who had put the sock on her held her nose tightly. My friend's body began to swell and her hands went up desperately back and forth, searching without luck for something to help her escape. Hey, what you're doing is rude. Poor Elsa can't breathe. Why don't you help her? As if following an order, the man took out a small knife and made a huge hole in her neck, which splurted blood and vomit. Elsa didn't fight anymore, and her eyes closed. Oh, Elsa. I'm sorry. Even if you don't believe me, I got attached to them too. Just like your little sister, Adam. What? What? I'll tell you how your adventure continues, Mr. Paranormal Investigator. He kept saying with a sarcastic tone. Now, you're going to go home and say that you were in a fight with your friends and they pulled you out of the van. You weren't here. Don't worry about the police. No one will bother you 
and no one will ask you questions. We made sure of that. Who are you? From now on, you will never be alone, Adam. If you try to investigate us, go to the police or tell anyone about this. Your little sister, parents, aunts, uncles, even your pet, they all die. With that said, the hooded man opened the door and the other two let me go. Terrified, I walked towards the exit to the eyes of all these people who were just staring at me. Before I left, the one who was talking stopped me one more time. One last thing. You are also forbidden to leave your job as a ghost hunter. Our viewers are a bit morbid and they all agreed that they wanted to see you looking for your friend's ghosts. So, you already have an idea for your next video, he said laughing. We will send you a video of today's show. After all, you are one of the protagonists. You will only get to see it once. If you try to record it or show it to anyone, we will know. Goodbye, Adam. If you ever find us on the deep web, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. <laughs> After that, I just left and drove as far as I could without looking back. A few weeks later, my YouTube channel mysteriously became much more successful. No matter how little effort I put into them, my videos went viral. I don't watch my own videos because even though I've never managed to capture a ghost, my subscribers sometimes see strange people hiding, just watching me. My name is Francis and I am graduating from high school next week. I am one of the few kids who is homeschooled and I can't complain about anything. My parents are very smart and were able to handle my education smoothly. I didn't have any problems socializing. I have many friends in my neighborhood and I even went to school until I was 13. I loved going to school, but after what I experienced that Friday, I never wanted to go back and my parents understood me. I remember that Friday was the last day before vacation. It was quite rainy, but I didn't care. In my head, I was already going to the beach with my parents and my older brother. That day, I had math and literature classes. The literature teacher was grading exams while we were reading. In exchange for being quiet, she didn't give us homework. So we were all more than happy. When her hour was over and we came back from recess, we hoped to have some free time and maybe get home early since the math teacher, Ms. Collins, was almost always absent. This teacher was only a substitute since the math teacher who was in most of the classes had retired this year. The rest of the professors were too busy to fill their schedules with more courses. So despite missing a lot of classes and getting along badly with the principals, this girl was their only option. We were playing online games with my classmates on our cell phones and it was already 15 minutes past class time and we were wondering if we could leave early. But suddenly, the door opened. It was Teacher Collins, and she looked furious. As soon as she walked in, she saw Laura standing by the door. And before she could excuse herself, Collins grabbed her by the hair and spoke in a loud voice. Laura, you were the one who got the highest score on the exam, so I'll let you out early. Go straight to the nurse's office and ask them to check your ear. Why my ear? Laura said, confused and sobbing. Instead of answering her, the teacher took a revolver out of her pocket, held it to her ear from the side, and fired it at the wall. All of us students were paralyzed with fear, wide-eyed and shocked. Laura, stunned and deaf from the gunshot, cried and hyperventilated in terror, while the teacher motioned for her to run to the infirmary. <laughs> Collins then shut the door and locked us all in the classroom with her. With absolute silence in the classroom, the teacher went to the desk, put her gun down, and spoke. Listen, you fucking brats. I'm having a shitty fucking day today, so I'm not going to repeat myself. If any of you stands up, talks, or uses your cell phone, I'll shoot you in the face. Understood? The kids were silent, scared, without answering her. In response, Teacher Collins fired a shot into the ceiling. Luckily, the classroom upstairs was unoccupied. Did you understand? 
she repeated, shouting. Before the kids could respond, there was a pounding on the door, and on the other side, a man's voice. Collins, what the hell do you think you're doing? Get out of there and get the kids out right now! The police are coming! I couldn't see behind the door, but that was the principal's voice. He didn't sound scared. He sounded angry. Pay attention. This is what will happen if anyone tries to get smart. Without hesitation, Collins fired three shots toward the door where the knocking was coming from. Suddenly, there was a thud against the door, and blood began to flow under the door. The children could not stand the pressure and began to cry inconsolably, but quietly. The teacher, aware that the police were coming, got up from her desk and approached my table, grabbed me by the neck and said, Hello, Francis. You usually behave well. You better stay still, listen to me, and be a good human shield, because if you misbehave, I'll kill you. No words came out of my mouth. I just took a deep breath and cried, frozen in fear. A few minutes later, the police arrived. Surprised by the corpse at the door, an officer shouted, Miss Collins, you're surrounded. Release the children and come out. You don't give me orders, you fucking pig. I have the children. Listen to me or I start killing them. I have more than 20. Do you want me to start with the first one? As she spoke, she put the gun to my head again. I still remember the cold metal clashing against my hair and how I felt it could go off at any moment. Lady, this is not going to end well for you. Let the children go and we can talk. I told you to shut up, pig. You want me to kill this little blondie? Stop pushing me. Okay, ma'am. What do you want? That's better. I'm willing to release all the children if you bring Officer Carlos Martinez. It won't be difficult. He's in this police station. I want him unarmed and in his underwear. If he's not here in 20 minutes, I'll start killing these little rats. Ma'am, don't worry. We'll try to contact him, okay? 19 minutes. She said angrily and bent down again, still holding me hostage. 15 minutes passed as if they were seconds. I couldn't stop looking at the clock. It was the last five minutes of my life. Colin seemed to notice this as she was also constantly watching the clock. Suddenly, a new voice interrupted our thoughts. Miss Collins, this is Officer Carlos Martinez. I'm here. Let's talk. You're finally here, hero. I want you to take off your clothes and come in with your hands up. I'll send a boy to open the door for you. I'll release this one when you come in and lock it again. Obediently, the process went as she planned. All of the other boys escaped. But instead of freeing me, she kept pointing the gun at me. Miss Collins, I recognize you now. Don't follow in your husband's footsteps. You became a teacher for the children. Your husband gave drugs to these kids. He took them out of school. No one asked for your opinion, you fucking pig. This is all your fault. You locked him up. Now, I'm alone. I have nothing to eat. Do you think that being a teacher, I can pay my rent? None of this would have happened if there were no rats like you. Filled with anger, she shot him in the feet, and the officer fell to the floor. As he fell, she let go of me and started kicking the officer, who tried to stop her, but found himself unable to move again as Miss Collins was pointing the gun at him. Suddenly, the door fell with a crash, and many men came in. Collins looked for me with her eyes at the corner of the classroom and raised her gun in my direction. But before she could even point in my direction, the FBI had already fired a burst of bullets at her and in the process, saved my life. When my parents picked me up, I was in shock. I started seeing a psychologist a few days later, and only last year did I get the courage to visit Carlos Martinez, the cop who almost sacrificed himself to protect me and the other kids. The policeman told me that a short time before, he had arrested her husband, one of the most important drug dealers in the city. Shortly thereafter, it was discovered that his wife, Miss Collins, was involved in her husband's business. Although she may have once been interested in the children, at the time, she was only using it to cover her dirty business. Martinez and I became friends, and even though I have no interest in becoming a police officer and being so close to so much violence, I will always remember him 
as the one who saved my life. I used to be very playful when I was a kid. My parents watched too many investigation TV shows, especially the ones on the crime and murder channels. My mother said I was too young to watch those things, but my father would end up convincing her, telling her that if I didn't watch it with them, I would end up watching it on my own. At first, they scared me a lot, but over time, I became passionate about the stories and decided I wanted to be a homicide investigator. I used to play at solving mysteries, seeing which of my toys were guilty of murders and kidnappings. At first, it was all I wanted to do during my free time, but over time, it started to lose its fun. It wasn't that I got bored with the investigations, but my backyard felt small to me. As time went on, I eventually sneaked into neighbors' houses, pretending I was investigating a murder. Some neighbors who knew me were cool with it and played along, while others got angry and got me in trouble with my parents. I remember one Saturday morning, my parents were watching a news story about missing teenagers in the area, and they asked me not to go too far away, just in case. I thought about going to my neighbor's house, but they were on vacation, so they locked their doors. I kept thinking about where I could go without going too far until a brilliant idea crossed my mind. Since my next door neighbors were on vacation, I could pile up my stuff in their yard and go into the neighbor's house on the corner, which I had never been able to access before. Inside was a middle-aged man, a very nice retired chef. Sometimes he was bored and would prepare food for the neighbors, and his daughter delivered it. Unfortunately, she had disappeared last year. After that, the chef still had a big smile and was very cheerful, but everyone knew it was his way of coping with a loss as big as that. Without wasting time, I prepared my investigation kit, and after sneaking into the neighbor's house, I piled up some boxes and chairs and entered the cook's house. As soon as I jumped in, I took a quick look at the garden. It was very tidy. There wasn't a chair out of place, and the grass was level with the ground. When I turned my gaze to the house, I couldn't investigate it for too long, as shadowy eyes were staring at me from behind the door, plunged in the darkness that encompassed the entire interior of the house. Terrified, I took a few steps back and tried to jump back into my neighbor's house. But I couldn't reach it. The shadowy eyes advanced through the door, and to my surprise, it was only my neighbor. He looked at me with a smile and began to laugh kindly as he caught me in his garden. I'm sorry. I think I startled you. I was just waking up and had all the lights off. You're the kid from the middle of the block, the one who gets into trouble, aren't you? He said in a calm voice that put me at ease. His appearance was neat. He looked like one of those harmless people that couldn't hurt a fly. He was wearing a t-shirt and long pants. He looked like a gentleman, even in his own home. Yes, sir, I'm sorry. I didn't come here trying to rob you. I was just playing at being an investigator, I said with an apologetic tone. <laughs> Of course you do, kid. I know everything about you. This sentence could have been quite threatening, but he said it so sweetly that I felt calm. Hey, do you want to have breakfast with me? I'll tell your parents that I invited you so you don't get into trouble. I talk to your mom at the market all the time. Of course, sir. It will be a pleasure. I answered with a smile. Upon entering the house that previously seemed dark and gloomy to me was now illuminated and revealed to be a beautiful house with expensive furniture and not a speck of dust. Wait here, kid. I'm going to make you some hot chocolate. I thought about actually sitting down. I wanted to make a good impression on the cook, but a noise from the basement caught my attention, and I told myself it was probably his pet. As a young boy, I was somewhat fearless, and I wasn't aware that after seeing a stranger, a dog could hurt me. So I opened the basement door and went in. I went down the stairs, looking for the source of the sound, and when I discovered it, I was shocked. That wasn't a dog. It was a teenage girl gagged and chained. I see you found Barbara. Congratulations, detective. The cook's voice sounded with the same kindness as before, as if I had really found his pet. Wh what I was so terrified that I couldn't utter a word. I just stood perplexed, looking at the chef. Barbara is my guest of honor. You should be more polite to her. After all, you'll soon be roommates. N no, no, uh, I'm sorry for snooping around the house. Please, let me go. 
How adorable you are. Do you think you came here by chance? No. Kid, ever since you snuck into my yard, your fate was sealed. What will you do with me? You see, young man, as he spoke slowly and carefully, he locked the basement door and walked down the stairs and toward the girl, walking past me. When one is a chef, you have a voracious hunger for discovery. Of course, at first, you settle for the usual recipes. But sooner or later, you get bored of eating the same old things. So you start looking for exotic animals and recipes. I don't understand, I said, scared. Oh, come on, kid. Of course you understand me. I always talk to your mother about you. Don't you also get bored of always playing at home? Wasn't it that same curiosity that brought you here? But it's not the same. Of course it is. And you know what? Soon you'll get bored of your neighbor's house. Just like I got bored of exotic food. Having said that, the cook stood next to the girl, who was just crying in terror. You know what we do when we get bored of something? We keep exploring. We look for even more exotic foods. Having said that, the chef made a quick move and pulled out a butcher knife from behind him, which he used violently to cut off the teenager's fingers. The girl gave a huge scream, which was drowned out by the gag in her mouth. The chef ate her fingers desperately, as if there would be no tomorrow. His calm, happy face cracked for the first time. His eyes widened as he desperately tore the flesh from his fingers. Once bored with the fingers, the man grabbed the girl's hand and ran his tongue over the wound as if eating an ice cream. Suddenly, his face returned to normal, and with a smile, he kept talking. <laughs> I must admit that I'm exaggerating. I'm not a brute. I cook my food. I season it. Now I'm just exaggerating to scare you. I'm sorry, he said while making a grimace of forgiveness. My daughter reacted just like you. The girl was the spitting image of her mother, you know. Although, she tasted much better. Desperate, I climbed down the stairs and started to force the door, but it was no use. It was locked. Meanwhile, the man slowly climbed the stairs and kept talking to me, showing me the knife. It's so funny how I couldn't hide my happiness after eating her, and people never noticed. They thought I was a wreck. <laughs> Suddenly, he was behind me. You know how much richer a veal is than a cow, kid. You are my little veal, he whispered in my ear. As soon as he said this, I still don't know if it was an impulse of bravery, survival, or if I simply slipped, but I lost the balance of my legs and threw myself off the stairs, grabbing the chef, who apparently was not standing properly, and he fell on me. When I fell, the chef had lost consciousness, but he was still alive. I could have stolen his key and escaped, but something got the better of me, and instead of looking for his keys, I grabbed his knife, which I used to stab him more than 20 times in the chest. That man was never going to wake up again. When I went back to my parents and told them everything, the police came and discovered that this was the kidnapper that they were looking for. The woman and I may have escaped, but neither had a happy ending. A few months later, I heard on the news that the girl committed suicide. I contemplated doing the same, but with years of therapy, I was able to control myself. Today, I am not interested in adventures or danger. I am one of those few people who would be happy living a quiet life with a boring office job. My name is Mary, and I am one of those people who believe marriage really is forever. Next month, I will have been married to Anthony, my husband, for 10 years. We thought it was a good opportunity to renew our vows. We were both looking forward to having a little celebration with our closest friends, especially considering how badly our wedding went. Anthony and I met at a bar, and from the moment we did, there was no turning back. Within a month of meeting, we were a couple. Within months, we were on vacation, and after a year, we had a date for our wedding. 
Neither of us believed in love at first sight, and we knew that doing something so improvised had its risks. But it was a risk that turned out well. By the day of our wedding, we had known each other for almost two years. We had several friends in common, so the wedding was going to be close. The celebration started out great. All the decorations were what we asked for, and everything was going specifically as Anthony and I had imagined. At the time of the wedding, I walked happily down the aisle with my father, while Anthony was waiting for me in a beautiful suit. All the faces were smiling, except for one. Among the guests was Claire, a friend of mine and Anthony's, who introduced us at the bar. Lately, we didn't have much of a relationship with her, so I hadn't invited her, but apparently Anthony had. The girl looked at us, furious. I had never seen her like that. She had hatred in her eyes, and she didn't try to hide it. She had some apprehensive look against Anthony, but it was more than obvious that she was focused on me. I decided to ignore her and look at Eileen, Anthony's sister and my maid of honor since she had been my best friend since I met her. After we said our vows and consummated the marriage, I was furious with Claire. Who does she think she is to ruin my moment and look at me like that? I went to find her at her table where she was sitting with other friends. How are you girls? I said, a little angry. Hey, beautiful wedding, Mary, said one of my friends. Yes, really beautiful. Claire's sarcastic tone caught my attention of all my friends. Thanks, girls. I actually came to pick Claire up. Could we have a chat? I said, looking at her almost as badly as she looked at me. Of course, dear. We definitely need to have a talk. So, to the perplexed and confused looks of my friends, Claire got up and we went outside the party for a chat. As soon as we stepped outside, I took out a cigarette and lit it in my mouth. After smoking for a moment, I gathered my courage and said angrily, Are you going to tell me what your problem is? I don't know. Maybe you should give me explanations. What? Explanations for what? I wasn't the one who decided to behave like an asshole and look at me like an angry little girl during the most important moment of my life. Oh, I'm sorry it all happened for you, princess, but you were the one who was a jerk first. At that moment, I was genuinely confused. I didn't remember ever doing anything like that to her. In fact, I was afraid to mess with her, as she used to be very violent and was known for getting into trouble. What do you mean? I asked curiously. You chose that bitch as your maid of honor? Really? After all we've been through together? What? First of all, I can choose whoever I want. It's my damn right. And secondly, we haven't seen each other in over a year. Oh, shut up. If it wasn't for me, you'd never have met him. You'd be nothing but a lonely little bitch. That was more than I could take. I lunged at her and started hitting her. She didn't put up any resistance. She just covered herself from the blows. After a few seconds, I was still trying to hurt her. It was like something had taken over me. No one was going to ruin my night. Between the blows, I started to see blood, and that made me react. I stopped and walked away. Panicking, I ran back into the wedding. Although I was leaving, I could still hear her talking. You'll regret not choosing me, Mary. I was supposed to be the fucking maid of honor. As I was leaving, her words echoed in my head. Was she angrier about not being a bridesmaid than about the beating I gave her? Whatever her reason for being angry, I felt terrible for what I did. I let my obsession with this wedding take over. I decided to go outside to find Claire to apologize but I ran into Anthony on the way, who stopped me. Hey baby, where are you? I didn't see you for most of the wedding. I was still too upset to answer him and didn't know what to say, but when he saw my hands, I didn't have to. Wow, what happened to your hands? Did you hurt your fingers with something? He said worriedly. No, this blood is not mine. What happened? 
After telling him about my fight with Claire, Anthony spoke to me resignedly. Hell, I knew this was going to happen. What do you mean? Look, baby, I should have told you, but I didn't want to worry you. The reason I invited Claire is that she just lost her boyfriend in a domestic accident. She was there and saw everything. She's not very well. Who the hell do you think you are not to tell me something like this? I'm really sorry. I know I was wrong, but... Without letting him finish, I ran to look for her. But when I got there, she was gone. I cried with guilt, and when Anthony arrived, he comforted me and we went back inside. Back at the party, everyone saw me looking sad and came up to me to ask what was wrong. My makeup was smeared, and even though I had washed the blood off my hands, I still had the marks from the blows I had given Claire. I was explaining to my cousins what happened, but suddenly, something stole my attention again, and I couldn't see anything else but that. Claire was back at the party. Furious and covered in blood, she was moving through the crowd like a ghost, unseen by anyone. Her walk was determined and frontal, and by the time I realized what was going on, it was too late to do anything about it. From one second to the next, Claire was behind Eileen, my maid of honor, and with almost surgical precision, she slid the huge knife used to cut the cake down her throat. Not knowing what was happening, Eileen gave a blood-curdling scream and immediately fainted. Her brother gasped in horror, while the girl used that same knife to stab herself over and over again. This is for you, Mary. Best friends forever. You made the wrong fucking call. No one dared to approach her as she did this. And somehow, she was able to keep going for several seconds before she fell. The party ended on the spot. Shortly thereafter, we learned that Claire had lied to everyone. Not only had her boyfriend not died from a domestic accident, but she was the prime suspect in the murder. Anthony could never forgive himself for inviting her, and I spent years feeling that everything that happened could have been avoided if I had been calmer with her. Whatever our mistakes, we decided that when we renewed our vows, the party would be in Eileen's honor, with only our closest family and friends. Do you believe that being curious is good or bad? After that day, I know where the saying curiosity killed the cat comes from. I was in high school when this happened. One day, I discovered that not far from my house, there was an abandoned building. Recently, it had become popular among the students to go to abandoned places and explore them. Besides, I thought that later I would have an interesting story to tell that would make me look like a cool person. Excited, I told my friends, Ethan, Christopher, and Matthew, and tried to convince them to go with me. At first, Ethan didn't want to come with us, but finally he agreed. Perhaps he didn't want to miss out on that experience. Anyway, we agreed to go the next day after classes ended. Walking to the place was a bit tiring as the building was quite deep in the forest, but we managed to get there after a half an hour. The place left us speechless. It was a pretty big building. The walls were dirty, covered in graffiti and plants. Most of the windows were broken, though that didn't help us see what was inside. After a few seconds, we approached the stairs. The front door was open and somewhat broken, so we could get in through there. We had to make our way up the stairs, as there was rubble along with the dirt and dust. So, the four of us stood still once we were at the door of the building. Go first, Steve. It was your idea. You're not scared, are you? Of course I was, at least a little. Now that we were there, I felt less excited, but I refused to admit it, so I went inside. Everything looked as expected. There wasn't much furniture, and what was still there was useless, broken, and full of mold. There was also graffiti drawn on the walls and floors, almost all of which were obscene words or drawings. At another time, I would have found it funny, but not right now. Suddenly, there was a loud noise behind us. The door had been closed with great force, which startled us. <laughs> 
Ethan, Matthew, and I looked at our friend, the last to enter, with annoyance. What? It was just a little joke. Once we inspected the entrance, we went to the other rooms. In all of them, there seemed to be exactly the same thing as the previous ones, which quickly bored me. For some reason, I expected there to be something more interesting in this place. It was actually quite simple, but perhaps I had judged the building too quickly. My heart started beating fast when I saw Ethan walk into the room at the end of the hall and stand still. The expression of fear and confusion on his face was unsettling. Quickly, the rest of us approached. Go away was written on one of the walls in red. The paint looked very shiny, as if it were fresh. Suddenly, Christopher started laughing. <laughs> you see your faces? <laughs> you guys are seriously scared? Our friend walked over to the letters and touched them. Then he showed us his hand, which was dry. Some asshole painted it to scare people. See? You guys are a joke. <laughs> it was pretty obvious, actually. But being in a place like this, with such a mysterious atmosphere and abandoned appearance, made you paranoid. Still, we soon started to feel comfortable and began to split up to explore. I was the first one who decided to go up to the second floor. From the moment I put one of my feet on that floor, an awful smell reached my nose. It was like something was rotting, which gave me goosebumps. What more could there be than a body? More out of morbidity and curiosity than anything else, I followed the stench, which seemed to come from the second room. I slowly poked my head into the room. Seconds later, I felt vomit in my throat, wanting to come out. There was a dead animal on the spot. Perhaps it was a cat, or perhaps a small dog. The truth was that it was in a state of decomposition, in which it was very difficult to distinguish what it was. It wasn't human, but it was very horrible to see. The worst thing, in fact, was that it had no eyes, just two black holes in what had once been its face. Ugh! I tried very hard not to vomit. Having my mouth stink of acid and food wouldn't be nice on the way home. Suddenly, I heard a sound behind me, coming from the first room. Ugh! Chris, stop it! I was already tired of Christopher's jokes. I couldn't believe he kept trying to scare us like that. When I heard the sound again, I was finally furious. Chris, enough already! Stop it! I quickly approached the first room in the hall. The fury I felt was replaced by fear as soon as I saw what was inside. I told you to go away. Could be seen on the wall this time. I thought it was another joke, of course, but then I couldn't see the paint dripping off the letters. This time, it was fresh. I stood there a few seconds, breathless, frozen, until I was able to react. Guys! I ran down the stairs while screaming. Soon the others, alerted, arrived. We gotta... Just when I was going to tell them to get out of there, we started to hear some voices outside the building. One of them shouted that we shouldn't be there. The other then yelled for us to go away. Perhaps it was the police. We all looked scared at each other, except Matthew, who made a sign with his hand for us to follow him. As quietly as possible, we walked to a room at the back of the building. We managed to close the door, which thankfully wasn't broken, and looked around the room. Apparently, this one had another door that seemed like an exit, since it was closed. Matthew's plan was for me to open it, since I had a certain skill at doing that. Not because I used it, but because it entertained me. I took out a small piece of metal that I had brought just in case and started. Quick, quick! I'm on it. It was taking me longer than usual because, apart from being nervous and under pressure, I had the strange feeling that something behind the door was watching me. Almost. The door finally gave way. I started to open it when I was able to notice that the air inside was dense. It wasn't a way out. Go away! A scream went out from the room when we were able to see what was inside. Terrified, I walked backwards, but tripped and fell to the ground. You shouldn't be here. Escape! In that small room, which did not even have windows, there were two corpses that at this point were nothing more than bones. Still, it was obvious that these were people. Terrified, the four of us ran out of that room. 
We didn't care if the police were outside. We just did it. But as we ran to the entrance, it began to tremble. The walls started shaking. The rubble began to fall. One of them hit my arm, but I kept going, despite everything. Luckily, we got away with just a few bumps and scratches. To our surprise, no one else was around. In the end, we decided to inform the police, despite everything. Inspecting the scene and the bones, they discovered that they belonged to a young woman who had disappeared a long time ago and a man who had escaped from prison. Since there were only bones left, they couldn't figure out exactly what had happened, but there were theories based on some evidence. There was a chain on the wall, and the door was full of scratches. There were also traces of some very old blood on the floor. The conclusion was that the man had kidnapped her, perhaps to torture or rape her. Somehow, the woman would have managed to hurt him, but during the fight, she was also seriously injured. In her state, she couldn't open the door and died. Meanwhile, all I could think about was what the voices said that day. Go away, and you shouldn't be here. Escape. Perhaps the man didn't want us to discover his crime, like the cowardly rat that he was. And I'd like to think that maybe the young woman wanted to protect us. For 10 years now, every time the calendar marks March 14th, I start crying inconsolably. My name is Samantha, and I am 35 years old. This very day, a decade ago, was supposed to be the happiest day of my life, but instead, it turned into a nightmare that I relive every year and can't seem to wake up. The day started in my ex-boyfriend Lucas's old car. Hours earlier, we had fought with my entire family, who had kicked him out of my house and tried to convince me how bad he was for me. That same day, Lucas had shown up at my house in the wee hours of the morning, asking me to marry him in Las Vegas, telling me to grab all my stuff, quit my job, and start a new life together. It wasn't the dream life I imagined, but I thought it was a great gesture on his part that contradicted all the horrible things my family told me about him. Tell me, what made you do this? I'm not gonna lie, I was beginning to think you didn't care about me. Hey, how can you say that? You mean the world to me. I was just a little uncomfortable with your family wanting to keep us apart at all times. Are we going to be okay, Lucas? I said doubtfully. Of course, my love. Everything is going to be fine. Just trust me. From now on, we are both going to be very happy. As soon as he finished talking, I grabbed his hand and smiled for the rest of the trip. Once we arrived in Las Vegas, we went to a hotel and left our things. I went to shower and get ready for the big occasion, but Lucas suggested that we go gamble first and then get married that night. I innocently agreed. What could go wrong with a little fun? The first time I really got upset was at the casino. I wanted to play with Lucas, but he sent me to go on my own. Why don't you just play with the slot machines? I get luckier when I am by myself, he told me after giving me a few coins. I frowned at him and left. I didn't want to fight with him on our wedding day either, so I let it slide. At least he had given me coins. It was the first time he gave me something. I played for a few minutes, but I was not in a good mood. I was getting married that day. I wanted to be with my boyfriend. I turned around and went to Lucas. He had no right to leave me alone after everything I went through to be with him. I went to the blackjack table, and to my surprise, he wasn't there. I started to look around the casino. He was nowhere to be found. After looking for him a while longer, I found him in the least expected place. He was heading toward the exit, without me. I went after him, but it was too late. He accelerated his car toward the hotel without me. Furious, I took a cab and arrived a few minutes after him, and when I opened the door, he was packing his things. What the hell are you doing? I shouted angrily. 
You're leaving without me. Oh, dear. What are you doing here? Let me explain. I was just about to come back and get you. Oh, yes, of course. That's why you're packing all your things, isn't it? I looked at his luggage, and there were not only his things, but also some of my most valuable things. I peeked into my suitcase, and it was open and messy. As I was inspecting my things, I found something familiar under the bed. It was the box where I keep my savings, completely empty. You sick fuck! Did you steal from me? Where are my college savings? Lucas was frozen with fear. We use them to gamble, but after we win, I was going to give them back to you. You have to believe me. This had gone too far. I was furious. I started to process all the things I was going to yell at him, but I was interrupted by a door slamming. Three men entered our hotel and rushed toward us. Who are you? What are they doing in our room? I shouted in desperation. What a long trip you made us take, Lucas. Did you think you could escape from your problems? I only came here to collect money to pay you, I swear. What? While I was still confused, one of the men came up to me and put something in my face. When I breathed it in, all I saw was white, and I fell asleep. When I woke up a few minutes later, I was in the desert. It was already very dark and very cold. I couldn't move. I was kneeling in the sand, gagged. Next to me was Lucas. I'll pay you back, I swear. Why do you think I came here? I could have escaped, and I didn't. Oh yeah, you definitely did. Otherwise, you would have told us. Don't you think? Besides, your time expired, Lucas. We were very patient. We even gave you an extension. At this point, we know you're never going to pay your debts. So, the boss decided that you're going to pay it in blood. No, 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 no. There's got to be a way to fix this. You... You can take her. Use her as a prostitute. Sell her organs or something. That would be enough, right? I looked at him in terror. He already knew I was awake, but he didn't care and kept looking at the thugs. You can't talk your way out of this. We've heard you more than enough. And to be honest, I never liked your voice. With that said, the man fetched metal bats from the trunk and began to beat him. Lucas screamed at the top of his lungs, but we were in the desert. No one could hear him. During the whole beating, I went to the car and cut the tape with a metal piece of the car, so I managed to free myself. I got into the car in despair, and to my luck, the keys were inside. The men saw me, but only one went to stop me. The sturdy man put his hands through the window and choked me while the others continued to beat Lucas savagely. With great effort, I managed to close the window, trapping the hands of my assailant, who managed to pull it out. One of the gangsters who were beating Lucas saw me, and, as if in response to my escape, he gave Lucas a strong blow to the head, tearing off a piece of his forehead and sending it flying. The man who was choking me kicked the car, a little frustrated. I started the car and accelerated. The mobsters didn't try to stop me. They just went back to beating Lucas. I told the police everything that happened, and soon after, I took them to where everything happened. Lucas was no longer there, but there was still blood in the sand. And when the police found a well and a dead body a few minutes later, I hardly needed to identify him. His body was unrecognizable it was clear that they had really taken it out on him. I didn't want to stay a minute longer than necessary. I just wanted to go back to my family. I couldn't believe that everything that man had told me was a lie. He even tried to sell me out to save his own skin. It took me years to trust another man again. After a while, I met Ethan, my current husband. And, well, let's just say that when we decided to get married, Las Vegas was out of the question.